Well, welcome to part two of the Paul Within Judaism Symposium, where we're discussing all matters related to Paul, Judaism, and his apostolic mission in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, today, we'll be discussing uh, a number of topics. Uh, first of all, we'll be looking at Paul's Ecclesia in the Jewish context, and we'll have some papers by Yorga Fry on the relativization of ethnicity and circumcision in Paul and his communities. Uh, and also, I think this is to begin with, Josh Garraway on metaphors for ethnic transformation in Philo, Romans, and Ephesians. Uh, that'll be followed at looking at Paul as a Jewish Christ believer, where we have a paper by David S. Starling. Uh, I will call them my people who are not my people, Paul's Gentile, uh, Gentile churches and the story of Israel. And then a paper by uh, Brian Tucker, uh, written in collaboration with his colleague, w Wally uh, Kirafesi. Uh, Paul's segmentary grammar of identity, ex-pagan Gentiles within the synagogue, and the importance of the eschatological pilgrimage tradition. So that's what lies uh, ahead of us today. Um, without further ado, I think it's uh, it would be fitting if I hand over to uh, Joshua. Uh, if you'd like to kick us off the session to Joshua. Great. Uh, thank you. So I think I'm going to talk only for about 10 or 11 minutes. I prepared some remarks this morning. Um, so I'm hoping people have read the paper or at least skimmed the paper, because I'm not going to go through all of the uh, discussions in there. I'm really not going to go through many of them at all uh, in my remarks. Also, I, I work on two screens here. And so I put what I want to say on this one. So the, But you guys are now over here. So that might be a little awkward, but I'm going to try to just read what I wrote and stare at the little hole above it. Um, so yeah, this should take about 11, 12 minutes, and then I look forward to having some conversation afterwards. Uh, I would like first to thank all of you for accommodating your schedules to be here today. I think I am the only North American left coaster here, and yet I have been given the plum hours for the conference, one to four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I know many of you are waking up early or going to bed late or missing meals with your families in order to be here, and I appreciate that. I was tasked with addressing the question, and here I am quoting Mike's email directly. How does Paul conceive of the ethnic identity of his Christ-believing assemblies in light of their faith in Christ? I have thought about this question for a long time, of course, and I regret to say that I think my best answer is, I'm not sure. And when I say I'm not sure, I don't mean I am not sure, although I'm not sure. I mean rather that I suspect Paul was unsure about precisely what was happening to God's people Israel in what he figured were the final moments of history. While I will get to the facet of this uncertainty that I addressed in my essay momentarily, I want to begin by approaching the issue in an unconventional and I hope not overly controversial way. It has occurred to me more than once over the past few years that Paul's wrestling with what we call ethnicity, and I do think that's a reasonable category to use when discussing Paul. His wrestling with ethnicity bears striking resemblance to contemporary discussions about gender that I see happening all around me. Now, I work in the shadow of the famous Hollywood sign smack dab in one of the most culturally liberal communities in the world, a place where transgender and gender non-binary students and colleagues are increasingly common. And I would be lying if I denied that this cultural change has been, as I think it has been for so many people who are Generation X or older, it's been a challenge intellectually, emotionally, and religiously. I grew up in a world where gender was widely understood in certain terms as inextricably linked with one's body and the circumstances of one's birth. When a person is born, we figure, it is obvious upon examination of the body whether it is a male or a female. And if, say, a male, then the person remained a male throughout his life. He might alter his dress, his affectations, even his body, in order to appear female, but he nonetheless remained a male because transition from male to female was simply inconceivable. But now things have changed. 
large part of my community now conceptualizes gender in a new way, as independent of the body and the conditions of one's birth, as a psychic understanding of the self. And as such, it is possible for persons whose bodies would previously have rendered them males to be considered females, and of course, vice versa. One even hears it said that persons with menstruating or pregnant bodies can be male, a notion that was inconceivable just a few years ago. Now, I'm not here to determine whether pregnant bodies can be male. I'm simply noting that such dramatic changes in the social construction of gender and the language used to describe it are real. And while my personal practice is to err on the side of kindness and decency and to refer to people by the name and the pronouns and the gender identity they prefer, if you ask me at the end of the day whether a transgender male is really male or in fact really female, I'm not certain I would know how to answer. So what has all this to do with Paul? Paul, I think, like his contemporary Philo, grew up in a world where Jewish identity was widely understood in certain terms, as linked inextricably with one's body and the circumstances of one's birth. When a person is born, they figured it was obvious, based on the parentage, whether that person was a Jew or not. And if a Jew, then the person remained a Jew throughout his life. He might alter his dress, his affectations, even his body in order to appear not Jewish, but he nonetheless remained a Jew because even apostates remained in some fundamental sense a Jew. And vice versa. Philo, and I suspect Paul too, at least for most of his life, believed that a person born a Gentile was everlastingly a Gentile. He might change his dress, affectations, and body even his God and his beliefs. But even such a transitioner remained just that, a transitioner, or in Greek, a proselyte, and in some fundamental sense, not a Jew. And yet things changed, at least for Paul. Paul came to believe that the final redemption of God's people Israel was at hand. And based on what he says was a revelation from the risen Christ, although I suspect it was more so many hours he spent poring over the prophecies of Isaiah and the narratives about Abraham, and Jacob, and Elijah, and biblical descriptions of covenants and of faith, Paul came to believe that the final instantiation of God's people Israel was destined to comprise people whose identity as Israelites was davka not based on the conditions of their birth, nor on some effort to transition to Israelite identity by altering their bodies or belief in accordance with the law. Rather, identification as Israel became a matter of one's psychic understanding of the self, which Paul would put in terms of pistis and pneuma and the like. This, I believe, is what Romans 9 through 11 is about. It's what Romans 2 through 4 is about. It's what Galatians 3 is about. It's about a reinscription of ethnic identity. And yet, and this is what I tried to demonstrate in my essay, however much Paul shifts from a conception of Israelite identity that is rooted in descent to one that is rooted in faith and spirit, the language he uses to describe the formation of the final Israel bears the imprint of the very Jewish discourse he aims to thwart. Paul's most famous metaphor, of course, is the olive tree, a botanical body that resembles the organic body Philo uses to describe the incorporation of proselytes, and even more so the plant imagery that Philo uses to describe both the incorporation of proselytes and the excommunication of apostates. And both Philo's and Paul's imagery resemble the anthropological body used by the author of Ephesians to describe the coalescence of Jews and Gentiles into a single Israel. And all of these images do two things. On the one hand, they describe how it is that Gentiles can alter their pedigree so as to join a people to which they naturally and historically do not belong, how Gentiles become a part of Israel's collective body. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> 
On the other hand, however, they emphasize the extent to which such a transition is at the same time inconceivable. And the result, as we so clearly see in the letters of Paul, is the often self-contradictory discursive mashup in which one and the same person can be described as both a Jew and a Gentile, as a part of Israel, but not as much a part of Israel as others, as circumcised, but also not circumcised, and so on. So coming back to the question presented at the outset, how does Paul conceive of the ethnic identity of his Christ-believing assemblies in light of their faith in Christ? I think he'd say that in light of their faith in Christ, they comprise the Israel of God. They are circumcised, even if they are manifestly not. And they are Jews, at least the authentic inside kind. But I also think he went to bed each night wondering whether that was really true. Certainly, he had plenty of opponents telling him that his new conception of ethnicity was preposterous. And I suspect that when he saw a naked, foreskinned guy eating pork from the Temple of Artemis on Shabbat while lighting a fire and wearing shatnez, he wondered whether the power of the Spirit was actually so powerful as to make him a Jew. And likewise, I suspect that his anguish in Romans 9 is genuine. I think he was kept up at night wondering whether his law-observant kinsmen, especially the kind and decent ones he must have known and loved in his life, had actually ceased to be Jews, chopped out of the people Israel like a dead limb from a tree. So I'll close by saying that I don't think these musings about Paul's bedtime routine are just that, groundless musings. I really do think they correspond to what we see in the conflicted and complicated letters he left us behind and especially so in the metaphor he chose to express his new understanding of Israel in Romans chapter 11. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Joshua. That was definitely um, succinct and uh, well put. Actually, that was, uh, dare I say, one of the most brilliantly succinct papers I think I've ever heard. I Normally, when you go to conferences, you're normally expecting someone to say, and ninthly, um, but that was, uh, that was very, very concise to the point, um, and a very provocative point as well, with a very, very um, memorable illustrations as well, so a good way to put it. Um, I think I'll, I'll hand over now to uh, Jürgen, uh, if he would like to um, ask a few questions or, or, or banter back and forth with you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Joshua, for your very interesting uh, summary of your paper and, and uh, really in the interesting approach. And also for your paper, uh, I, I agree with you in, in a number of perspectives. And I think the uh, comparative look at a metaverse is really helpful because the metaverse always allow for a certain negotiability. They can be uh, used to express unity, togetherness, but of course, also remaining differences and the lack of complete harmony can also be phrased within those metaphors. Uh, I also, uh, allow me to, to take a contemporary example. Uh, if Swiss soccer players, the Swiss national team, which was very good at the uh, European championships, uh, most of them are uh, migrants from Albania, from the Balkan, and of course, um, they have a Swiss passport, and if they make the goals and, and, and are su successful, of course, they uh, are Swiss. But if they do not um, make the goal in the penalty, uh, maybe they are Albanians, and all the people say, uh, are they really Swiss, and so on. So this kind of negotiability is, of course, in, in our current discussions on ethnicity, and I, I suppose um, it's the same problem in antiquity that... Uh, the, the official consideration, the self-attribution and the attribution of the acceptance by, by others is also uh, might differ and might be a question of social um, negotiations. Um, my interesting my point where I'm interested in your in your paper is the efficiency, where you uh, say that efficiency continues the Jewish, the division of the world between Jews and Gentiles, near and far away, near is Israel, far are the nations. And of course, uh, efficiency takes up 
the language of Paul. I, I would like to uh, discuss uh, at a point uh, whether it's um, maybe due to the order construction, of course, that the order speaks through the mask or the, through the prosopon of, of the historical Paul and, and takes up, of course, uh, a number of uh, elements from Pauline language. But then if, you, if we see that efficiency takes Paul on a kind of, let's say, abstract language, if he talks of apostles, of course, it's not this, the, the precise historical situation of the apostles, but it's a kind of uh, abstract um, talk about the foundations of the church and so on. Uh, how clear are those contours of near or of Israel in Ephesians? When you say uh, in the language of Ephesians, um, the Gentiles are in some way embodied into the body of Israel. Can we still say this or is this um, body of the, those who are near already in a kind of uh, abstraction in, in that way? Uh, I agree with you that there is not an, a third ethnic group as we have it later in the second century, but how far are we in Ephesians on the way to such a view? Um, of course, he speaks of blessing in the heavenly realm. Um, he speaks of a summing up all the all in Christ in chapter one. And of course, then uh, the abolishing the law with its commandments that separate. So does not Ephesians understand at least Paul in a way of uh, doing away or separating uh, uh, that separating law in favor of a cosmic unity of Christ, so that Ephesians is in some way an interpreter of Paul that understands Paul in a, uh, a way he's closer to Paul than we are, but is on the way to a kind of uh, distinction, differentiation, new created identity of Christians uh, as we have in the second century, not already there where um, Diognetus and Tertullian are, of course, but on the way to that. That would be my question to, to see how that process historically uh, can be reconstructed. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think that there is a, a, a more cosmic and more generalized or abstracted, I think you said, uh, approach to the issue in Ephesians than we see in Paul. Um, I will tell you what what turned me on to Ephesians was actually not the metaphor in chapter two first, it was uh, uh, 417, uh, because as I began my paper, I'm fascinated with Paul's claim in 1 Corinthians that his believers used to be Gentiles. And mm -hmm. Ephesians seems to suggest, at least in 417, that Gentiles are something other than the people he's writing to. Um, and that is what got me thinking that Ephesians is doing a similar thing to what Paul's doing in saying, yeah, you're not Gentiles anymore. Well, you're still Gentiles, but you're, you know, you're not Gentiles anymore. And he works that out, I noticed, in this very similar way in Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, the big question for me then was, is that uh, anthropon that he's describing in chapter 2 Israel, as it is, say, I think the olive tree is in Romans 11, or is it something... Uh, broader and more universal, as a lot of the commentators uh, seem to think. And my reading from the beginning of, I think it's maybe 2, 11, 12, where he talks about the near and far from Israel and talks about it in political terms, and then uh, comes back to the same terminology about near and far at the end, uh, and then also talks about them being co-citizens, mm -hmm. means that I think the best way to understand that human metaphor is the same way as the botanical metaphor as a demonstration of Israel. And of course, what I also tried to emphasize because, I don't know, I read, uh, was it David Horrell? I read that book about ethnicity and I'm now wary of over universalized views of, of ancient Christianity. Um, that, you know, when you say that Jewish conceptions of Israel were particular because you had to, say, be circumcised in order to be in, and everyone else was out. Is it more universal to say what I think Ephesians is saying? You have to be baptized to be in Israel, and if you're not, you're out. Is one more universal because it's a choice you make? Um, I guess being circumcised is a choice, too, maybe not to, uh, uh, being born to a certain person. So what I tried to emphasize is that the notion of 
one corporeal body that represents God's people, Israel, over and against people on the outside who are called explicitly Gentiles, that sounds a lot to me like Jewish ethnic discourse. A bit different from Paul's, yes, and probably something that allows the developments in the second century, um, if Ephesians isn't in the second century. Um, yeah. But I've talked too long. I, I want to hear what other people say more. I know what I think I, well, until tomorrow. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, throw, yeah. I'll throw my first question in for you, Josh, um, using sure. my MC privilege. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, on, on Philo, uh, I wonder if Philo has a little bit more of a precedent for Paul, because uh, Philo has this category of the Israel who sees God. He seems to be understand that there's like an ethnic or empirical Israel, but then he has this category of Israel who sees God, and it's a very elastic um, and, and a malleable category, and it basically applies to any um, ethically upright monotheist so you could, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure Philo would probably include someone like Plato in that category. And in my mind, that's, that's, that's got to be the number one sort of precursor to Paul's using land. Because Paul, for Paul, Israel is always a positive term. He may kind of um, discourse negatively about, yeah, you die off, um, which I think he equates with sort of a type of Pharisaism in some places. But Israel is always a positive term. And I wonder whether the sort of main precursor to what Paul does is Philo's idea of the Israel who sees God. Uh, for sure. Um, I mean, I'm sorry I didn't incorporate, maybe in the longer version, uh, I, I will in incorporate that further. But yeah, and, and I tend to think about Jewish identity you know, across different times and places, which is why I'm often accused of anachronism, but, you know, people do scholarship in different ways. And it's not, um, it's not uncommon in different Jewish settings for this concept of an Israel who sees God. I guess it's similar maybe to God fearer. Um, and then in the rabbis, they'll develop the, um, I guess in English, you'd say like the righteous of the nations. Uh, but I don't think that's what Paul's doing. I don't think Paul sees a special sort of category for Gentiles who are a little bit better than other Gentiles. I, mean, I think he thinks there is a fundamental shift in the cosmic identity of Gentiles who are baptized, that they become actually God's people, Israel, and that Jews who don't lose it. Okay. Well, th thanks for that, Josh. I think Matt's got a question for you. Uh, feel free to ask your question, Matt. Uh, thanks very much, Josh. Uh, it was great, hey, as Matt. I would expect. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, maybe this is clarification. Uh, I mean, it was a wonderful paper. I'm wondering if you would uh, match up your argument in this paper with your first book uh, on Paul's Gentile Jews as a category if you apply that to the, the gender metaphor you used, right, does it, does it mean Paul's, that he, it, it's as if he's not fully on board, right, with, with uh, transgender affirming, so to speak. He's, he's kind of, he has a failure of nerve that, that he says, well, you're, you're both a Gentile and a Jew. So deep down, he knows they're not really, really Jews. Is, is that the case? And so, so he wouldn't be as sort of affirming as we uh, uh, would speak nowadays about transgender rights. Is that is Well, that first of all, I would How note that, that, that mo um, there are more people in the transgender community, I think, who identify as gender non-binary than as uh, transgender, uh, which would be a case where someone says, you know, maybe that's the, maybe that's Galatians 3, right? Oh, come on, yeah. all this whole Jew Gentile, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't describe me or something like that. Uh, yeah. But no, so what I what I tried to argue in that book is not that that and, and also in this paper, it's not that necessarily Paul is confused. Paul genuinely thinks, I think, that the power of Christ's resurrection is that it enables non-Israelites to become Israel. But you can't describe that in ways that don't reinforce the old paradigm. I mean, it can't be done. In the same way that what's fascinating is you sometimes you'll see in the in the, the gender bending community today, you know, that while at the same time they're undermining gender categories, 
they'll they'll acknowledge that like a dress is very female. Like wearing a dress is how I express my femininity. Well, but that just reinscribes the old distinction between male and female, even as you're trying to break it down, because there doesn't exist language that hasn't been used before. You can't create your own new language. You can only create a language for describing the world out of the language that's already been there. And so Paul is trying to explain how what Israel really is is different. But you can't do that without using all of the language and the metaphors and the imagery about Israel that simultaneously reinforce the other side. That's what I, and so what I argued is not that Paul thinks his, his charges are Gentile Jews. That's just a made up term that, that provides the analysis that says, well, well, he's trying to call them Jews, but he ends up calling them Gentiles and Jews at the same time. And here's why. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the contrast between a non-binary identity as opposed to a trans identity is actually a really interesting application in this case, I think. Uh, By the way, just to express my gratitude to all of you, I was up for like an hour last night and talking to my wife, like, should I say this? And, and it takes a lot of trust in today's academic world to even broach this kind of subject. And so I thank you for listening and giving me the benefit of the doubt. And yes, that's all I'll say. I think we also have a, another question from Jürgen. Yes, I, I want to get back to the question, what does really change? Is, are the categories firm and the individuals change or are the categories reframed uh, belonging to the salvific community, to the people of God is redefined in a way uh, so that more and others fit in because of other criteria. I think you, uh, for the moment, stress the change of the uh, individuals that can now uh, undergo a change and, and belong to Israel in a way. But in my view, in, in Paul, also the, the, the uh, Israel is, is in some way changed and redefined so that others fit in uh, on the basis of different criteria. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I understood the distinction and the two things you were saying, because I, I kind of agreed with bro, both. Um, I think Paul's, his problem is that he's working with a category of Israel that he sees as a biblical category that goes back to Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And there is a covenant with Israel. And Israel is some kind of group of people that when Jesus returns are going to be saved. And the question is, on that day when Jesus returns, who are those people? And while the traditional reckoning of what constitutes Israel was determined by dissent, what he's saying is that is not the case anymore. And it was yeah. long ago foreseen that that was not going to be yeah. the case. It was always foreseen that at the very end, faith was going to be the new criterion. And so it is. And I think in Romans 9, he explains that quite beautifully, that in fact, all along this principle was at work. If you noticed, no one saw it coming, but it was coming. And now it's happening. But I also think that Paul then had to describe that phenomenon using the language that already existed. And what I tried to suggest in my remarks today, although there's no way to prove it, so it has to remain something of amusing, is that I suspect that Paul had a certain hesitation and a certain difficulty in looking at like best friends he had who were Jews. And he's now saying, nope, you're not really Israel. I mean, that's, I imagine was very hard for him to do. Um, so that, that, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's maybe a clarification of where I am. Thank you. We have a question from Carl Wilhelm. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for this really nice presentation and brief presentation and very clear presentation. Uh, and I would like just to bring into the debate an aspect which you didn't talk about, but perhaps could be a way to uh, go beyond this 
problem of finding the right criteria for what is Israel, what is not Israel, what is a Jew, what is a Gentile. Sorry for my bad English. I hope to be understood, but I try to express what I have in mind. Uh, for Paul, I think it is not only a question of definition, what is a Gentile, what is a Jew and how to be a Jew and what, what does it mean or a Gentile, but it is a sort of story, it is a course of events, what he has in mind. And not only the event of one single person who becomes a part of Israel, uh, although he uh, was before a part, uh, uh, was a Gentile, but it is a course of events which is much bigger. It is uh, the history of Israel in a theological uh, approach. Uh, so what, what we call in German Heilsgeschichte, a big course of events where the one single Israelite is only a, a, a tiny part of it. Uh, it uh, everybody is a part of this big story which happens and Paul has to find his own understanding of what that what what there happened at all because he has no clear model for that what he has experienced when he uh, was called to become an apostle to the Gentiles that was for him quite surprising and he had to find his place in this big story in this big uh, course of events and uh, therefore he has to find new solutions for the question well who are they who I am uh, uh, who I encounter and uh, it's not a form of of abstract definition, what is a Jew or what is a member of Israel, but it is uh, rather uh, looking for a place for himself and for those people who encounters in this big course of events, which we in German call Heilsgeschichte. Maybe this is an aspect we should have in mind if we discuss about the question of ethnicity, because then it's not any longer about ethnicity, but it's about uh, being a member of Israel, becoming a member of Israel, or even uh, uh, becoming an apostate. Uh, and that's Paul has, has to, to struggle with these uh, questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. So. Uh, I, I, I love the point about Heilsgeschichte and, and I mean, my, no one reads my book, but the, I did, I think I had a great image for representing Heilsgeschichte um, in, in Romans 11, where I suggested it's similar to the way old animation used to work. I also hold it a whole bit on a Averroes, which was a mistake, but it, the way animation used to work where, you know, you draw a picture of Israel and then the second picture is the next generation of Israel. And the third picture is the next generation of Israel. And as Paul says in Romans 9, that the Hales Geschichte is that in each generation, Israel is a little bit different. Um, now, when you, when you flip them all together like Walt Disney did, it looks like a continuous Israel. But actually, in every generation, it's different. That's what he says in Romans 9. And I think the way I might describe it is what Paul's doing as he sees it is he's drawing up right now the very last page of the movie. What is that final Israel going to be? at the very end of all the flipping. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is that this may just be a, different in a, a difference in assumption based on how we come to the literature, but I'm not sure that I would say that Paul had a call to go to the Gentiles and then tried to figure out why. But that's because I don't believe, I don't believe Paul communicated with deities. Um, so I, I would say that Paul on his own, through his own musing about what he had heard about Jesus and what he read in the scriptures, he came to his own assumption that he was meant to be an apostle uh, to the Gentiles. So I don't think it's that, that he was, he was sort of charged to do something and then try to figure it out. I think he figured it out on his own. Um, and then that's what led him to think of himself as an apostle to the Gentiles, because he decided that had to be a part of it. Again, I don't know if that has any major implications in the way we would read things, but um, sorry. I think got a question now from Brian Rosner. Uh, thanks, Joshua. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still thinking through all sorts of these issues, and this has been really helpful. I love the illustrations. 
So the extent to which Paul relativizes, removes or retains ethnic distinctions. And I think the following paper obviously will develop and take the discussion further really well. Um, I, I think one text that goes close at least at, at first blush to establishing a third identity it's one that I don't think Jörg mentions either, is 1 Corinthians 10.32, where he talks about uh, uh, give no offense to... Can you go back for a second? Because maybe it was just me, but right when you said what verse you were talking about, yeah, I got well, a hiccup. Sorry about that. 1 Corinthians 10.32, where oh, Paul yeah, says yeah. give no offense to uh, to Jews, Greeks, or to the Church of God. And again, Church of God, as, as you have just pointed out, is, is kind of a Jewish category itself um, in the LXX. But um, yeah, I, I wonder if, and then in the, the following paper, Jörg points out that in the second century, there is a kind of third, uh, a third race almost discussed in some texts. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I do. So, I, I mean, if you haven't figured it out, I, I don't think that that supersessionism just emerged out of the blue in the second century. Um, I think it's because it's what Paul says. Uh, and, and, and the same thing with the notion of the church as a third entity, that I don't think Paul conceptualizes it explicitly that way. But I think he says, look, we're the new, we're, he doesn't say new Israel. That's a whole essay I'm writing right now. He, we're Israel. We're, we're the real thing. We're the real McCoy, this, this church. But he's not stupid. I mean, he looks outside the city and he says, there's still a synagogue and then there's the Goyim and we're this third thing. Now we're really that thing, but we don't, people don't understand that we are really that thing. And so this is why his language is so full of contradiction, including the possibility of saying, look, don't offend anybody, not the Goyim, not the Jews who think they're Jews, but aren't Jews, which is the way Revelation would put it, and not us in here, the real Jews who no one thinks are real Jews, but we're the real Jews. And this is the kind of, this is the way language works. This is the complication that people really live in in the real world, where you have to constantly redefine and redescribe what you're saying because language is, is contested, to use a nice postmodern term. And so I do think, though, that that, that tripartite description that he uses without really thinking about it is precisely why this kind of thinking down the road can lead to, yeah, you know what? No one accepts that we're the real version of them anyway. So look, we're just something different. And that's how I argue that, you know, Christianity as a third term and a third group ultimately emerges in the second century. It's not out of the blue. So, thank you. You got one final question from uh, Joshua to Joshua. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot, Josh. It's really stimulating. Um, and uh, I'm still wrestling with how to ask my question, but I think it's, it, it's, it's basically something like this. The, my understanding, at least, of the patriarchal promises that show up through Genesis, as well as the that Paul obviously draws upon extensively, as well as some of the prophetic oracles that speak of uh, the nation streaming to worship the God of Israel in Zion, both, both those prophetical oracles as well as those patriarchal um, promises seem to me, at least how I've understand them, to operate with an ongoing distinction between Israel and the nations. It's just that the nations um, come to worship the right God or the God of Israel. And so at one level, maybe there's some transformation of ethnic identity and that they're leaving behind their old gods, they're recognizing the, the God of Israel, but nevertheless, at least within my understanding of Genesis and those prophetic oracles, it seems as though there's still a distinction between um, uh, Israel and the nations. Um, do you agree with that? And is that something then, if you do agree with that, is that something that Paul then understands those patriarchal promises and prophetic oracles in a different way? Well, I'm a little less clear on the patriarchal promises. Certainly the prophetic oracles about the nations flocking to Jerusalem. I, I, when you say patriarchal or oracles, are you referring to like, um, like Genesis, Lechlecha when it says Genesis, that, you know, the Gentiles... No, I just mean like be, Genesis 12, Genesis 17, 22, you yeah, know, yeah, where... Yeah, to me, that, that's a little less clear because, you know, what it means that the, the nations will be blessed through you is not all that clear, at least, and not as clear as, as the prophetic text 
talking about. And this is the quarrel that I seem to get with uh, uh, get in with Paula every couple of years um, because we, and she'll be here tomorrow, but I, I hear her saying, look, the way you should understand Genesis and the prophetic oracles and the way any first century Jew would have understood it is that it means X. And, and that might be right. But all I try to argue is that I don't think that's what Paul tells us he understands those to mean. Right? Yes, it would make sense for Paul to say, Israel qua Jews is being saved along with a Gentile hangers on that are pilgrims at the end of times. That would be, that would make perfect sense in light of the scriptures he was working with. I just say, I, I don't think that's what he says. He interprets it a different way. And to me, that's made clear in Galatians 3 and Romans 11 and Romans 2 through 4 and all these other texts. Um, and, and, and then she will tell me that I'm ignoring context. And I would say, well, maybe you're ignoring text, but I wouldn't say that because she's exalted and, and, and deservedly so. Um, but that would be my counter argument. Is, is context king? Well, maybe. But text is pretty damn important too because Paul actually said what he said, not what we want him to say or what we think he should have said. Sorry. Thanks, Joshua. Thank you, everybody. This was very helpful. I have wonderful notes. <laughs> Thank you. No, I love that expression. Uh, context is king, but text is, was it text is pretty good too? I don't know. But yeah. Okay. Well, so, I'll watch the, I'll have to go back and watch the video. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's a useful saying. Uh, okay. We're now ready for our second paper this morning from um, uh, Jürger, who's uh, also tackling this, the topic of Jewish identity and um, Christ believers. So I'll hand it over to you, uh, Jürgen. Thank you, Mike. Um, I will try my best. I'm cer certainly not so brief uh, as Josh was, um, but I will try my best. Uh, so I skip my first part of my paper and uh, start uh, rightly on page four. And I uh, want to state that one of the most important things to be discussed within or in uh, with regard to the Paul within Judaism school is the ethnic difference between Israel and the nations. Is it a fundamental and permanent distance, which is also considered to remain within the eschaton, or is it a kind of um, malleable and negotiable and changeable uh, situation? So I uh, get to page, uh, yes, page three of my paper. Um, I will focus on the most fundamental point of the Paul within Skudos uh, Judaism school, the criterion of ethnicity. The advocates of the Paul within school perspective rightly emphasize the importance of the distinction between Jesus, between Jews and non-Jews for Paul. Herein Paul represents a characteristically Jewish classification of the world. Any general idea of universality is a modern entry and anachronistic to Paul. However, it must be critically examined whether and how this distinction is also eschatological transformed in ancient Jewish contexts, including Paul. Scholars emphasizing Paul's Jewish identity have demonstrated how Paul's perspective is fundamentally shaped by Jewish ethnic categories, such as the basic distinction between Jews and Gentiles or Jews and Greeks. Only once, Paul does use the Greek distinction of Greeks and barbarians in Romans 1.14, but then immediately returns to the Jewish pattern with the phrase, first the Jew and also the Greek. So there can be no doubt that Paul is keenly aware of ethnic matters. These aspects belong to the basic experience as a Jew in the Cilician diaspora, and ethnic concerns were also the background of his activities in persecuting the group of Jesus followers, where he probably saw the boundaries of Judaism endangered. And if there were indeed mixed communities, Paul would have to negotiate not only religious, but also ethnic diversity on a regular basis. In any case, Paul was concerned with Jewish ethno-religious concepts or ethnocentrism. Instead, Gentile is strictly speaking, not an ethnic category as those Gentiles would see themselves as Galatians, Pisidians, Egyptians, or Romans. So what is ethnicity? Modern sociological thought has made us aware of the fact that ethnicity has to be understood within the framework of discursive constructions of identity, rather than in terms of genetic origins. 
Ethnicity is a matter of culture and not of nature. Although many people in antiquity, as even today, might take an essentialist stance towards various aspects of ethnic, social, gender, or sexual identity, we can hardly ignore that the sociological insight that ethnic identity is socially constructed and subjectively perceived. It is a cultural construct perpetually renewed and renegotiated through discourse and social practice. Ethnic discourse is therefore a form of rhetoric that is deployed to mark boundaries between and among groups of people with negotiated views oscillating between poles of fixity and fluidity. Hutchinson and Smith list six criteria that in varying degrees constitute ethnicity, a collective name, a foundational myth, a shared history, a distinctive culture, a common territorial origin, and a sense of solidarity. All these aspects are part of the process of rhetorically negotiating ethnic identity and the implications are one self understanding or position in society. In ancient Hellenistic culture, such ethnic negotiations were omnipresent. All ethnic groups in the Hellenistic Roman world, including Jews, were necessarily involved in such reasonings. I take an example from Ptolemaic Egypt from Sylvie Honigmann. She speaks of the category of nested identity, and I find it really helpful. The overarching category of Hellenes, Hellenes was extended to encompass all immigrants, including Thracians, Judeans, and other groups, if they participated in Greek language, literacy, and culture. Many of them adopted Greek names and also dynastic family names. So even native Egyptians and of course also Jews could make their way into the privileged category of the Greeks and quite practically and as important, enjoy fiscal privileges. That all these groups did not share the same cult degrees was not an obstacle for inclusion in this category. Of course, there were also essentialist positions, probably among all groups in the Greco Roman world. Ancient Romans and Egyptians did not see ethnicity in these historically fluid terms, although within their world, negotiation about that identity and related privileges practically happened everywhere. If born Egyptians strive for the privilege of being considered Hellenes, and if people from all part of the Roman Empire took their chances to get the privilege of citizenship. Strongly essentialist views were also present in Second Temple Judaism, most obviously in priestly circles. A priest can only be such by a priestly descent and cannot become a priest by choice or by learning. He cannot study theology for be become a priest. According to the priestly shaped worldview of the Kubran Yachat, it is divine presentation that decides the fate of all humans, so that a real conversion or change of one's religious status by learning is impossible. However, other Jewish groups, like the Pharisees, embraced the possibility of learning, and in diaspora Judaism, Jews were aware of the possibility of conversion with the effect of a real change of religious or ethnic status, at least in theory. According to later rabbis, a proselyte was equal in all respects to the native born Israelite, although not all of the rabbis were entirely convinced of the equality between the convert and the native. And sometimes it's the, uh, the distinction that the son of a convert, if is born by a Jewish woman, he is a Jew. If he's born by another woman, he may be still a proselyte. So it's obvious that most Jews, especially in the diaspora, consider a change of ethnicity possible. Again, the idea of a nested ethnicity might be helpful as those proselytes would of course keep some aspects of their earlier ethnic identity as Egyptians, Syrians, or Romans. But the historical evidence does not support the idea that for Paul as a diaspora Jew with Pharisaic learning, the ethnic boundaries were so fixed and impenetrable that he might feel it necessary to prohibit Gentiles from becoming Jews or that this idea would stand in the background of Paul's warning to his Galatian addressees. The permeability of ethnic boundaries is then also evident in the second century, where Christians appear more and more in the internal as well as in the external perspective as a third group alongside Jews and pagans as a new ethnos that is not characterized by origin from a particular earthly country, but by belonging to a symbolic heavenly realm. Such a new identity as a new or third genos, and I think the translation race is a problem here, genos is, is maybe something different, alongside Jews and Greeks, is protectively advocated in the epistle to Diognetus. The new genos is rooted 
in the cultic difference, the new worship, and also new teaching. But ethnic categories are mixed with civic and political categories, so that ethnicity is but one formative pattern, among others, in the construction of Christian identity, complemented by other metaphorical clusters that appear more central to Christian self-definition. And I think we have to ask why in that period in the second century, it seemed to be important for Christians to uh, use ethnical categories uh, alongside Romans to place themselves in the society. From these second century developments, we can go back to Paul. Are these developments, including an ethnic description of new identity in Christ already laid out in Paul? And how is the identity shaped by Paul in his letters related to the ethnic identity and practice of Jews? How does he address aspects of ethnicity in his letters? And to what extent does it matter? Let us start with a few unsystematic observations. Of course, Paul speaks of himself as a Jew or an Israelite, and he expresses solidarity with his kinspeople, Israel, according to the flesh. He also enumerates all the merits of his Hebrew, precisely Benjamin, Benjaminite origins, his Pharisaic learning, and his exemplary Jewish way of life, albeit in the mode of the past, and it's unclear how much of this way of life he has retained as an apostle. He clearly states that he no longer values these advantages in Christ as advantages. Paul regards his former ethnocentric perspective, his boasting in his exemplary Jewish existence, as severely relativized. Second, Paul also values, values a salvation historical priority of the Jews, but he also considers the advantages with regard to their present sociological status strongly relativized. In certain passages, we can see a perspective of Jewish ethnocentricity in the background of his verdicts. The Gentiles are all sinners. However, compared with Philo or with many other ancient authors, Paul does not use ethnic or ethnographic stereotypes. Now, barbarians is used only once, uh, two, uh, two times. Only the order of the pastors then lets Paul out of the quote, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. With regard to his addresses, Paul rarely uses ethnic categories, but rather mentions their location according to cities and Roman provinces. It is even unclear whether his insult, oh, you mindless Galatai, actually addresses ethnic Galatai, or rather people of the province Galatia who were actually Pisidians or Lyconians, etc. The Gentile and sinful past of his addresses is often mentioned, but Gentile is not used at the same level as Jews. From a Jewish perspective, it's a counterpart of Jews, but not an ethnicity or nationality comparable to Jews. Greeks, Romans, Scythians, Ethiopians, these are nationalities. Gentile is something different. Sometimes he, Paul uses Greeks also in the sense of Gentiles from his Jewish perspective. But being from the Gentiles seems not to be of central importance for the identity Paul wants to address and shape. Thus, in the openings of his letters, he uses markedly other terms. Ecclesia, which is a neutral, non-ethnic and non-cultic term, or designations that refer to God's calling or saving act, such as hoi kletoi, those who are called, hagioi, who are holy, hagies menoi, who are sanctified. Thus, in spite of Paul's thoroughly Jewish perspective, he does not address his communities in openly ethnic or cultic terms. He seems to avoid particularly Jewish terms and likewise all kinds of terms linked with paganism or pagan cults. Instead, he uses neutral terms from the world of political assemblies, terms that point to the divine activity in Christ and at least one when speaking of the heavenly polytoma, the notion of a very different, namely heavenly citizenship or ethnic affiliation. But is this new identity only an identity apart from Judaism? Does it only include Gentiles or former pagans who now venerate the one God for Jesus? Is the Paulan Ecclesia void of Jews? Or is the view suggested by the Paul within Judaism school in itself anachronistically shaped by the later separation between synagogal Judaism and the emerging church? Historically, it's in my view more than plausible that after his life-changing event, Paul's, Paul first narrated his experience and also preached his new insights in the Jewish communities where he used to be hosted. And when he was later called to work within the community of the Christ followers in Antioch, he found there a community of Jews who were open to Gentiles in the eschatological mission, but did not perhaps start at one point not to circumcise them for whatever reason, probably more practical than strictly 
con theological reasons. The also practiced table fellowship. Uh, Paul ended that mission, contributed to it, and later continued to act accordingly, but he did not invent that practice. Admittedly, these historical considerations are partly based on acts. But what can we say from the authentic testimonies of Paul? Were there Jews in his communities? Did he speak to Jews? It cannot be denied, in my view, that Paul is not the only Jew in these communities. Some other fellow Jews are mentioned by name, including Apollos, who is a Jewish Jesus follower, Prisca and Aquila, who are, according to Acts, a Jewish couple who, along with other Jews, were expelled from Rome. Later, they worked together with Paul and Corinth and hosted an ecclesia in their house. Paul also calls Andronicus and Junia, another couple, probably in Rome, his kinspeople, that is, fellow Jews. And if the Crispus mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1 is, was indeed a synagogue leader, as Acts 18 claims, he would be another example of an individual Jewish uh, person who worked together with Paul in his missionary work and probably shared also his strategy and attitudes. Should we really seem, assume that all these Jews, as also Paul himself, did not mix with the Gentile believers nor have table fellowship with them? This would be absurd. But in fact, if in fact they mixed in some manner, perhaps the Gentiles adapting to Jewish sensitivities as far as possible, how could Paul's letters then have been read publicly? And how could they, who, who did hear, who did listen to the reading? Can we really assume that only one part of the congregation, the subgroup of the Gentiles, was um, approached by Paul's letters, listened to the reading of the text? Didn't Paul at least have to reckon with the fact that Jews and Jewish Jesus followers were also listening? Even if the composition of the congregation addressed by Paul cannot always be assured, there are in some, in any case, some Jews within and around his ecclesiae, and it's inconceivable that they would have separated themselves from the Gentiles without Paul protest protesting, as he did in view of the Antiochian incident. Of course, the incident mentioned by Paul in Galatians 2 is told from later memory and with a particular argumentative intention. Paul recalls the incident because he recognizes there a, preced a precedent for the Galatian crisis. He narrates it from his memory and creates an incident for his address to Peter. What actually happened can be left aside here, and it is irrelevant whether or not Paul actually spoke these words to the historical Peter. If the argument was to be effective, the narrative and the reported speech had to be plausible for the Galatian addressees. I want to make two important points. First, there is the clear memory that Peter, as a Jewish follower of Jesus, and also Barnabas, another Jewish believer, had practiced table fellowship with the Gentile community members over a certain period of time, without separating for reasons of purity and food laws. In Antioch, at least, a large city with probably many different synagogues, one such mixed community had developed and was initiated, initiated tolerated, or even presided over by Jewish followers of Jesus, who were apparently open to accepting Gentiles in their assembly and their table without imposing on them the Jewish dietary laws. This is historically conceivable, and it's also conceivable that other Jews disliked this and intervened. Second, there is the memorized address of Paul to Peter, who is explicitly addressed as a Jew. Here, Paul clearly adopts a Jewish ethnocentric commonplace. We are Jews by birth and not sinners from the Gentiles. The we includes himself and his fellow Jew, Simon. Thus, here Paul explicitly speaks to a fellow Jew about the truth of the gospel. Of course, Paul did not evangelize Peter, nor could he really teach him. But he makes it clear that in his view, the truth of the gospel is also valid for his fellow Jew, Peter, and thus also for the attitude of other Christ-following Jews toward the Gentiles. From this example, it's also clear that Paul considered the truth of the gospel relevant for other fellow Jews following Christ in the way they observed dietary and purity laws in communion with Gentile believers. This is, in my view, an example that shows that the presuppositions of the Paul within Judaism school are historically problematic and not in accord with Paul's ex explicit views. When Paul says, with an exemplary first person singular, that he is dead to the law and crucified with Christ, this is also potentially valid for Peter and the other Jews addressed in the memorized speech in Galatians 2, and of course for the addressees and the Judaizing influencers in Galatia. In various passages in his letters, Paul deals with circumcision, but the manner he discusses it, and also the Torah, 
Paul does not appeal to pagan and certainly not to enlightenment arguments, but instead applies motives and contemporary inner Jewish debates to the situation of the communities of Christ followers and the question that arose there. Circumcision had been the physical and permanent marker of Jewish identity for men since the exile and increasingly since the crisis under Antiochus. Greeks and Romans considered it a blemish that it became the exclusive nota judaica in the Roman Empire, which was not renounced even in the diaspora. The Judaizing agitation against the practice of admitting Gentiles without circumcising them in Antioch and Galatia aimed at the adoption of circumcision with the opinion that this would also make the converts committed to other Torah commandments. Those Judaizers certainly did not subscribe to the view that Gentiles must not become Jews. They rather thought that those Gentile converts should not stop halfway. In Galatians, Paul consequently counters the agitation with a discussion of the meaning and function of the law. Paul himself was circumcised on the eighth day, and I think it's quite probably that he also fully accepted the practice of circumcision among Jews, including circumcising Timothy, who was born from a Jewish mother. Paul considers circumcision of high value as a sign of God's affection to Israel. But as he explains in Romans 2.25, the historical pre is not a sociological plus. With regard to salvation or divine judgment, circumcision is only valid when the law is observed, as the observance of the law is the criterion of divine judgment. But in view of the factual sinfulness of all humans, Jews and Gentiles, circumcision is of no sociological use. It is not a reason for security of election, nor is it the occasion for boosting. It no longer has a sociological value in itself, but is decisively relativized. Conversely, being uncircumcised is no longer sociologically relevant due to the saving divine action in Christ. For the worthlessness of circumcision, Paul cites his own example. In spite of his perfect Jewish upbringing, he can no longer put his confidence in what he calls the flesh. Not only in Galatians, but also with regard to his adversaries in Corinth, he also rejects the desire for a change of status after their calling to faith. A change of status through circumcision or likewise a removal of circumcision is generally denied. But the reason is not because of the impermeability of ethnic borders. It's not the idea that Gentiles must not become Jews. The reason is instead that the status granted through circumcision and thus ethnic status does not matter. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters is obeying the commandments of God. In Galatians, he adds a further argument. An additional circumcision of the Gentile Christ followers, subsequent to their faith, would be a denial of the sufficiency of the same work of Christ, an act of unbelief that could even result in the loss of salvation. As some other Jewish authors of his time, Paul speaks about circumcision in a figurative sense in which Jewish and Gentile Jesus followers have a share. This is not outwardly visible, but in secret, not in the flesh, but a circumcision of the heart, not in the letter, but in the spirit. With this notion of circumcision of the heart, Paul can draw on biblical and early Jewish parallels, Philo. But in contrast to other Jewish orders, or with Philo, Philo, the figurative circumcision is not an additional dimension, but is rhetorically used to show the relativization of the fleshly circumcision, the ethnic status. This circumcision of the heart actually redefines who is really a Jew or Israel of God, while outward circumcision contributes nothing to this. Thus, Paul can even claim that the figurative circumcision is the real thing. We are the circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. This severe relativization of the identity rooted in circumcision was conceivably offensive to many Jews around Paul. Yet it's presented within the framework of Jewish questions and trans traditions. Paul relativizes circumcision and its meaning not as an enlightened universalist, but as a Jew. An initial element of Paul's Jewish perspective is a halachic distinction between Jews and Gentiles. The law does not apply equally to all. Only Jews and proselytes are obliged to keep the Torah as a whole. Uncircumcised people are not. Paul presupposes this distinction in Galatians 1, 5, 1. In the consensus of Judaism of his time, Paul presupposes the close connection between Torah and circumcision. <clears throat> circumcision is not only a supplement, but in principle obliges Jews as well as proselytes, if they are circumcised, to observe the whole Torah. 
The question of the Gentiles' participation in salvation implicitly takes up discourses that diaspora Judaism had to res resolve. Most diaspora Jewish communities at the time faced the question how Gentiles could associate with the synagogues and thus with the people of Israel. Paul does not favor the pattern of the god fearers, a pattern of second order membership. In his view, Gentile believers in Christ should share a full participation without restriction as synagogues only granted usually to full proselytes. But as this full access to the community of salvation or even to the people of God is now possible without physical circumcision and without the full obligation to the Torah of Israel, we arrive at a new definition of the conditions of access and thereby also a new definition of the salvific community, the people of God. In Paul, this is justified sociologically through Jesus' vicarious death, pneumatologically by the manifestation of the spirit in the uncircumcised and exegetically as the promise to Abraham came before the law. It is quite conceivable that this view and practice led to conflicts with other Jews and with diaspora synagogues, not only because of a kind of rivalry with regard to sympathizers and supporters, but for reasons of principle. From other Jewish perspectives, this could be considered the fundamental abolition of elements that seemed um, unacceptable to the vast majority of contemporary Jews. With this position, the apostle could appear as an apostate to other Jews, and although he himself rest, uh, although he himself rest, restlessly worked for the ties between Jews and Gentile Jesus followers, he contributed tragically to the further separation between the growing Gentile Christian Church and Judaism. It is no coincidence that Paul, in this context, uses fresh terms. He uses the traditional idea of the new creation when he pinpoints the fundamental relativization of circumcision. Neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but new creation. The reference to the eschatological newness and to God's creational activity claims that behind this redefinition of the identity of the eschatological people of God, there is nothing less than God's eschatological acts in the Christ event. How is this related to matters of ethnicity? Is the relativization of ethnic boundaries a removal? Are ethnic boundaries now completely abolished towards a universalism of the emerging Gentile church? Can we read Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there neither slave nor, slave nor free, neither male nor female in this sense? Are all these boundaries not simply adiaphora in Christ? Or are the three pairs of opposites not on the same level in Galatians 3.28? It is significant that modern interpreters embrace the view that differences are or have to be completely irrelevant with regard to gender and social status. Perhaps there are different dimensions of political correctness at work here, so that sensitivity with regard to ethnic aspects is a different one. Be that as it may, the term adiaphoron, taken from later theological debates in the Reformation period, is probably misleading here. And we can see in many passages that Paul is not ethnicity blind. But opposed, the opposing view stressed by Denis Buell and Karen Hodge that Jewishness or a Judean identity is the umbrella under which he locates all those in Christ seems also an overstatement and inappropriate in my view. Looking at Paul's ecclesiological terminology it is significant that he does not use ethnic terms when addressing his communities, that he utilizes new terms such as new creation when circumcision and the classical identity markers of contemporary Judaism are relativized. It is significant therefore that these new communities are something different from the synagogues and are of course also different from the Gentiles. But the eschatological new entity is not given an ethnic name nor an ethnic definition. Not yet. In the second century, there will be. There's only the talk about a heavenly polytoma, not an earthly one. The move of second century authors who then begin to label the Christian communities in ethnic terms, such as a new genos, in distinction from Jews and pagans, is a further step. And it would require some more reasoning to explain why those authors then chose the label and defined Christianity within the Roman Empire in ethnic terms. But this is a different story and it's not Paul's concern. For him, the aspect of participation in the eschatological community of God is of primary importance. And therefore, there is neither Jew nor Gentile in Christ and neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Thank you for your patience.
Thank you very much, Jürgen. Uh, that was good. Um, I, I, I've read Paula Fredrickson's paper and I noted some instant contrast with what you were doing on several things there. So um, if part of me wishes Paula was here, she'd probably have several things to say, but we don't have Paula. We have the next best thing, I guess, which is Joshua. Uh, so Joshua, I'll ha ha um, hand over to you. Do you have any uh, questions or comments for Jürgen? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, first of all, I love, uh, I, I don't know if I've heard the word relativize uh, it, to describe what Paul is doing with a lot of ethnic terms in Judaism. And I, I, that I found very helpful for me to think through, uh, because I think I agree in, in that I would say that Paul relativizes everything, or at least subordinates everything Jewish to pistis. And that it is pistis that then grants you circumcision and descent from Abraham and all these other things. I guess my question would be on the matter of relativize versus uh, remove. Why do you think? So Paul can say something like circumcision and uncircumcision doesn't matter. But elsewhere he'll say, we are the circumcision. And, you know, if you follow the, in Romans 2, you know, if you, if you do the right thing, it's, it's basically like you're circumcised. And so if it's being relativized or removed, why does he, why is he still so interested in laying claim uh, for his people that they are, in fact, an Israel of God, sons of Abraham, circumcised? I get that's my question. Thank you. Um, I think this is this has to do with Paul's orientation towards scripture, towards the salvation historical priority of the of the history of Israel. He's he's eager to to uh, give reason for everything what has happened now is uh, according to the law and the prophets. In of course, read in a in a prophetic way, but uh, that his his testimony is in accordance with the scriptures, and so uh, he still of course tries to link everything what he does and what he what he teaches uh, with those scriptures and and uh, so the, the whole the whole um, event is uh, the whole period he he works within as, as a final uh, eschatological period Romans 15 is, is important he Paul ascribes to himself even a kind of high priestly role to bring uh, the the harvest the, the offering of the gentiles uh, to israel so uh, and and therefore i think the priority of those terms is important and of course as long as in in within his uh, uh, area there are of course jews people from of jewish descent who are circumcised who who live in in that heritage of course um it is still important and, and they should be circumcised. They should continue with their traditions. This is, this is clear. I think the, the change is then later uh, when, uh, well, the, 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 just the number of Gentile Christians outweighs those of Jewish Christians. And when, uh, on the other hand, the Jewish people, uh, some of them at least, uh, will not be, willing not be able to uh, be so, let's say so tolerant or so um, uh, com making compromises uh, with regard to uh, relativizing uh, their the halachic uh, ideas and and uh, then of course tragically uh, the the ties paul wants to keep uh, in his whole life until his uh, journey to jerusalem uh, and then uh, that breaks breaks apart and he cannot he cannot hold it so i, I think in the end, Paul is for me a, a tragic figure. He he always wants to keep these ties, and and uh, maybe he he uh, demanded too much of his fellow Jews within the Christ believing communities, uh, and they uh, were not willing and not uh, prepared to uh, to act accordingly. So that that's that would be my my image of Paul. In the end, a kind of tragic figure, and and. A, Parting of the ways, uh, the historical process is then, of course, something that Paul would never have wanted. Thank you. And I'd love to hear what Mark has to say. 
Well, I was going to say, oh, there's a question there from uh, Mark. So, uh, Mark, what's your question? Hi. Um, let me hey, start Mark. by saying I've contacted the same shrink that I contact before I play golf, because at the end of the golf round, the, the, the M that I am is not the M that I want it to be most of the time. <laughs> so like with Ruben yesterday, I have to start with a, with a, with a disclaiming the nanos that you have discovered, uh, who actually agrees with you very much. Now you have lots of stuff that we could talk about, but, but the one thing I thought um, on the few, few moments uh, to talk about was, I completely agree that there are Jews in the Christ subgroups of the synagogues. And I actually argue this in all of my works since mystery. And I argue further that those are subgroups of the Jewish community, that there are other Jews around that Paul probably has, uh, anticipates, will learn what he argues. My, my argument all along, and I don't know if the language is, is correct. I've seen lots of people argue about the proper language, but my point all along is his arguments are made for the instruction of the non-Jews present in these groups. The historical construction is a completely different matter. I really think there are Jews there and they're the leaders of the subgroups when they're around. Of course, there might be cases where there were no Jews in the town or there are no Jews that Paul is able to, to persuade. Uh, that's possible, but I still think he tries to start as a Jewish subgroup because that's what this movement is, a Jewish subgroup movement. So in terms of the, the um, pushback that you're giving, I step aside. And I think most Paul within Judaism people would step aside. What we're trying to argue, and, and I'd like to show you what, what difference it makes. Um, what we're trying to argue is that if you take his statements, instead of universalizing them as statements, and you almost always say, for non-Jews in Christ, or some whatever formula you prefer, it changes the dynamic meaning. So for example, when you reach the end of your um, argument, if you agreed that the rhetorical audience target is non-Jews who are in Christ, which is also an important qualification, um, then when you say this, but as this full access to the community of salvation, or even to the people of God is now possible without physical circumcision and without the full obligation to the Torah of Israel, we arrive at a new definition of the conditions of access. I would add, bracket, for non-Jews. That's the qualification missing. And therefore, also a new definition of the salvific community, bracket, for the way non-Jews are justified, legitimate as part of that community. In Paul, this is justified, brackets, for non-Jews in Christ, soteriologically through Jesus's victorious death, pneumologically, and so on. So that's the difference that I tried to labor to make and still want to make, because I absolutely agree with all the other texts that you brought out. I cannot make sense of anyone thinking and, and I know people do say, you know, these are Gentile churches. Well, I just don't make, that doesn't make sense to me um, as Paul's movement. They're Jewish uh, subgroups. Uh, and how, what the proportions are doesn't matter. It's the non-Jews who don't know how to behave, don't know how they belong, have problems fitting into um, space because other Jews don't conform this and nor do their neighbors, nor do their parents or their children or their Greco-Roman uh, civic leaders, or, or nor the imperial leaders. Nobody agrees with this idea that they're full members of the community of God without becoming members of Israel, uh, without becoming Jews, without being completing proselyte conversion. So I, I just leave it at that one point. You have many we could discuss, I think, for easily a long time, uh, the different points, but, um, but I just say that one. Thank you, Mark, for that uh, correction. You write so much. It's 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 sometimes it's difficult to to uh, get everything together. But one question is: uh, Would I uh, like to pose back? If we think that Paul's letters, let's say Romans, are read with the main argument, uh, 
towards Gentile Jesus believers, but with Jews listening to that. What does this mean to them? Even if they are not the main target, the main group uh, the argument is for, but of course they, it's, uh, and I, as I said, the truth of the gospel, Paul talks uh, to Peter in Galatians 2. What does it mean to them? Uh, how can we imagine they react, they, they are expected to react? Well, it's read in, within the subgroups. You know, the paper coming up from, um, from Brian uh, about the synagogue uh, subgroup community, or they, 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 they leave the larger group, but they have their own assembly. In that so assembly, let's, let's go to the next room. We we read a letter, and you don't you 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 shouldn't hear. Is that is that the imagination? Well, no, they meet they they meet around the Christ thing. That's not what everyone else in the community does. They're a subgroup. You know, the charismatic groups in the mainline churches have a subgroup meaning. They 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 their leaders speak to them in in a language the rest of the uh, the rest of the larger church community might find really bizarre and and who knows what. But um, so. So to qualify the first point, the letter is aimed at subgroups of Christ followers, which include Jews. And they would hear this. And I think Paul's instructing them. This is the, he, they're hearing, this is the way it ought to be. This is what ought to be presented to them. If you're presenting something else, he's correcting that indirectly. I think they're there. Mm -hmm. But I do think his echo chamber, if you will, is broader because he can anticipate that these subgroup communities have to communicate with the larger Jewish community. I, I think that's there. I just don't think that's his primary or even secondary. That's his thirdary uh, uh, concern, but it's there. I wouldn't deny that at all. And I, I, I don't have a real problem with um, trying to imagine how they might hear this, knowing they're not the direct audience. But I think, in, for, for example, in Galatians, I think he kind of anticipates um, what the pushback from the influencers will be. And he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's anticipating and answering it like in the allegory where he gets into this very Jewish midrashic kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I doubt that the non-Jews in Galatia, if they work all day and scratch out a living, can follow very well. But anyhow, I hope that, 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 that answers it. And if I could ask you a question back, but Mike, maybe there's other, maybe someone else. Um, if I could ask a question back, Mike, um, it would just be, um, I'm a little confused about where you're, you would place your reading. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it in the traditional or the new perspective? Or is it a Paul within Judaism? What are you, I'm not quite sure what you're doing here because uh, I could, as I navigated your paper, I wasn't sure what you were, um, in terms of the category, you know, we're talking about Paul within Judaism. I'm not quite sure where you came out, and I wondered if you could speak to that. I'm a reader of Paul. <laughs> of course, of course, I am a stubborn Lutheran <laughs> in some way. No, uh, I, of course, I, 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 I am trained in, in classical uh, Lutheran interpretation. Of course, I've learned a lot from the new perspective, and I try to make sense of some points of the Paul within perspective where I'm uh, struggling a bit more um, but I think that's uh, <laughs> that's the attempt attempt to make to make uh, to make sense of all these uh, ideas but thanks as much as I'd love us to continue this conversation between uh, Jürgen, Mark, and bringing um, uh, as well Michael and Ryan uh, we, we do have to get into our break time uh, sadly. Uh, so I'm going to put a pause on it. Um, why don't we come back in, um, in, in, my, in a, how about we make it a 15 minute break so we can grab some um, coffee or tea or maybe some um, upflu schnapps uh, <laughs> d depending, depending where you are in the world and what would be time appropriate. Um, I'm sure it's um I'm sure it's five o'clock somewhere in the world, so maybe you can break out the schnapps or something. So uh, let's take a break, and uh, when we come back, um, I believe we'll have first up, we'll have uh, Brian, then followed with David. Uh, but otherwise, can I also uh, thank uh, Joshua and Yoga?
for uh, terrific papers uh, for our second day. Uh, lots of lots of things to discuss there. That was that was terrific. So we'll pause there and then we'll come back. And we're back with the second half of part two of the Paul Within Judaism Symposium. I'll now hand over to uh, Brian Tucker. He's going to take us through uh, Paul and his segmentary grammar of identity. Hey, thanks to Mike and Brian and those that uh, organized this. And it's a chance to learn. Uh, taking a lot of notes over the last hour. And uh, so I'm going to ban Josh and Yorga from being able to say anything during the question time. So we're, we're set. All right, so uh, Mike Bird has recently called interpreters to identify the particular socio-religious location of Paul and his converts, as well as the theological texture of his argumentation. This paper does that by addressing three topics important to the Paul within Judaism perspective, the way in which Jewish covenantal identity continues by the use of the segmentary grammar of identity, socio-religious location of the Paul and Christ within the synagogue community, and the importance of the eschatological pilgrimage tradition, for maintaining distinct identities for Israel and the nations. These three topics will provide a slightly different entry point into the debate over whether in Christ Gentiles have become Israel, Israel redefined, eschatological Israel, or another Israel-like category. In order to assess more clearly the relationship between Israel and the Ecclesia, the work of Bauman and Gingrich will guide our research. They identify three overlapping grammars that aid in the construction of identity and difference, orientalization, segmentation, and encompassment. The suggestion at this point is that the grammars are either intentionally or unintentionally used by New Testament scholars and contribute to the conceptualization of Paul's Gentile Christ groups as either within, without, or somewhere in between local expressions of Jewish patterns of life. One would be Israel and the church, us versus them. That would be orientalization. This relies on the resources of binary thinking in order to construct a sense of self and others so that the two are either seen as a mirror image of each other. So, that which constitutes the self would be seen as good, while that which identifies uh, the other would be bad. This dualism constructs two oppositional groups, us versus them. Second would be Israel and the church, absorption into. This would be the encompassment. It classifies personal identity and that of other via the logic of sub-inclusion. Here the other is, appro is appropriated or co-opted. The larger group uh, identity subsumes those underneath it. It relies on the logic of synecdoche, in which a part can be used to signify the whole, but unlike segmentation, encompassment is non-dialogical. Third, Israel and the church, foes, but also allies extending Israel. This would be the segmentary logic. It's situationally specific in a sliding hierarchy of the self and others that relies on processes such as fusions and fissions. The other may be my foe at a lower level of, ab of abstraction, but at the same time, an ally at a higher level of segmentation. Paul's view of Israel's continued covenantal identity may be an example of segmentary logic. At one level, he views some of his relations as enemies of the gospel, while still at another level, maintaining that God has rejected his people, so that their covenantal identity continues even after the coming of Christ, and then eventually all Israel will be saved. So what is Paul doing? Well, in terms of segmentary logic, he's asking his Gentile auditors, in spite of an apparent rejection from some first century Jews, not to consider Jewish identity in opposition to, but as part of a newly integrated uh, community based on God's mercy poured out to all, both Jews as Jews and non-Jews as non-Jews. This social grammar seeks to retain the salience of individual indexes of identity. Segmentation is the most overlooked grammar among traditional interpreters of Paul. One example that uh, should uh, make us aware of the grammars that are evident uh, among traditional interpreters uh, would be that of the work of Francis Watson. Watson, uh, his general approach is this. It's argued here that Paul advocates a sectarian separation between the Christian community and Judaism, rather than an inclusive understanding of the one people of God as encompassing even uncircumcised Gentiles. The grammar of encompassment evident uh, in this reading of Paul's arguments in Romans based on the Orient Orientalist assumption in Watson's work. Christ movement identity in this letter must be understood as an us versus them. In reflecting on the earlier arguments, Watson restates his claim. The social reality which underlies Paul's discussion of Judaism and the law 
is his creation of Gentile Christian communities in sharp separation from Jewish community. Paul is seen as one promoting an ideology of separation and offering a reading of Israel's scriptures from, uh, for the purpose of legitimating their separate existence. Notice Watson's explicit Orientalist argumentation. The separation in the, in the form of an ongoing argument about scriptural interpretation and attempt to show that the true sense of scripture, the one that attests to the truth of the gospel, belongs to us rather than them. Now, we're not arguing that there is no evidence of encompassment or Orientalist thinking in Romans. It's just that the segmentary grammar is too often ignored or downplayed. The usefulness of Bauman and Gingrich is clear here. All three of these grammars overlap and are used in the formation of identity and difference. It seems to us that Paul's arguments move more in the direction of segmentary grammar rather than the encompassment or oriental ones, since he expects the continuation of difference within the Christ movement in Rome. Since this is crucial to our claim, we'll briefly highlight how this might work in Romans. The segmentary grammar is dialogical and is a move away from encompassment, which is monological. It works best in settings where shifting and intersecting identifications are evident. Romans 14 and 15 is just the case. Here, the discussion over table fellowship is punctuated not by an us versus them mentality, but one in which the continuation of difference is expected. In verse 5, Paul writes, Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Further, the expectation of different social practices is evident when Paul connects faith to them, as well as even more foundational instruction to accept one another. One might have ex uh, expected Paul to not tolerate Torah-based practices in light of some of his earlier statements in the letter. However, in these chapters, Paul acknowledges the continuation of difference at the subgroup level while seeking to maintain unity at the higher level of social practice. This is classic segmentary grammar and represents a move away from the predominant influence of encompassment or orientalizing logic often seen in Romans 14 and 15 interpretations. Paul seeks to form an identity for the Gentile Roman Christ followers that embraces existing ethnic and social identities rather than extinguishing these, or at least is shifting away from existing institutional contexts, as is evident in Watson's approach. Seeing a continuation of Israel's covenantal identity rather than putative subsumption would suggest other interpretive improvements in Romans. First, the traditional eschatological miracle view in 11, 25, and 26, uh, which in turn provides a basis for the continuation of Israel's identity. Second, Citation of Deuteronomy 32.43 and Romans 15.10. And again, uh, he, the Davidic Messiah, says, Rejoice, O nations, with his people. Shows the continuation of Israel's identity, especially with the final phrase, with his people. Citation is identical to what is found in the Septuagint and describes a directive in which the nations are now to worship with Israel, not instead of Israel, as encompassment logic would demand. I think I'll skip the rest of that and jump down to the ex-pagan Gentiles going to synagogue. In our continuing desire to answer Bird's question, uh, we now ask, did Paul expect his Gentile Christ followers to go to synagogue or to go to church? Our question is a question, uh, well, the answer to this question likely depends on whether we conceive of the relationship between Paul and Israel as contra-Judaism or intra-Judaism. Watson was a good example of the former, while William S. Campbell of the latter. Bird is a fine example of the both and approach found among scholars today. He's a sort of bridge between the contra and inter perspectives. Uh, we could uh, now re, uh, look, revisit the contra and inter perspective via the synagogue studies. Scholars such as Fredrickson, Nanos, and Arnsbarger have argued and established a synagogue with a socio religious space from which Paul recruited Gentiles variously associated with the God of Israel, the Christ movement. They do seem to make the best sense not only of Paul's use of Jewish tradition in addressing the Gentile audience in his letters but also the evidence from Acts, which portrays Paul in synagogues recruiting both Jews and non-Jews. So in light of what we know about the participation of non-Jews in synagogues, Paul likely expected his Gentile Christ followers would continue attending assemblies in which non-Christ following Jews were present to suggest an intra-socio-religious context for the Pauline Christ movement. One problem is scholars tend to speak about the phenomena of the synagogue in antiquity and speak of it in monolithic religious institutional terms. And while uh, it was able to exercise, there, there was some kind of uh, one that could uh, exercise supra local authority over all Jews everywhere. Concomitant with this notion of the monolithic Judaism as if the synagogue functions as a synecdoche for Judaism as a whole. 
The synecdoidizing language features in Pauline studies, for example, uh, Delio Del Rio's work, Paul in the Synagogue, contains no actual study of synagogues. In another recent volume, Paul is persecuted by and forced to submit to the authority of the synagogue. Even behind the better phraseology, the synagogues, there stands a notion uh, the synagogues in the Mediterranean world were somehow uniform in both ideology and social organization. For the presentation purposes, we'll just stipulate the existence of public civic synagogues and focus on the Greco-Roman Association synagogues in the diaspora, since these provide the institutional context we have in mind, associations within an association. Local unofficial association synagogues did exist in the land of Israel, synagogues of the Essenes mentioned by Philo, synagogue of the Libertines in Jerusalem mentioned in Acts are good examples. They were more prominent in the diasporic uh, context where Jews were not politically autonomous and the boundaries between Jews and other non-Jewish neighbors were porous or even non-existent. Some examples, Peter Richardson's compared the ar uh, architectural remains from the first phase of the Ostia Synagogue to the remains of Ostia's Association of the House Builders, a decree uh, preserved by Josephus from Gaius Caesar to the Jewish community, either in Delos or Parium, uh, calls the Jewish assembly there a religious guild. In an, un an uncomplicated life, Philo described the Therapeutae uh, as gathering together on the seventh day, uh, which, which seems to have been some sort of private room uh, set apart for special use. In short, association type synagogues were not public civic institutions. Association synagogues are the type of institution most relevant for understanding the social religious organization of the Pauline assemblies. Two observations. First, Richard Lass has argued for the existence of associations in which devotion to Yahweh was at least one connection among the group, whether or not the primary one. We're often not, uh, we're often not ethnically homogeneous some uh, were ethnically associated with Jews, while others were ethnically diverse, and had occupational links, which were socially binding features. In other words, it was not unusual in antiquity to see Jews and non-Jews together in the same gathering spaces in which the Jewish God was either a patron deity or uh, of the group or simply one among others. Second, there's evidence of smaller Yahweh associations with different social networking priorities that could exist within the larger ones. For example, Josepta Circa IV uh, describes the great Alexandrian Basilica Synagogue as a large association of Yahweh worshipers, who, however, did not all sit together, but rather sat in smaller groups according to occupation, goldsmiths by themselves, blacksmiths by themselves, and embroiderers by themselves. The purpose of this grouping by occupation was merely pragmatic, quote, so that when a poor man came uh, into the synagogue, he joined his fellow tradesmen and in that way uh, enabled to obtain a means of livelihood. Another example is the Nisa inscription from Asia Minor. This third to fourth century CE inscription mentions a person named uh, Menandros, uh, who built the place for the people and for the assembly of Dositheos, son of Theogenes. Dositheos was a common Jewish name in the Hellenistic Judea. This coupled with the use of the synagogue term, the place and the people, suggests that the inscription refers to a larger, perhaps ethnically coherent Yahweh association of Jews and a smaller association founded by an individual Jewish man, both of which use the same building for their assemblies. While the inscription doesn't make it clear, it's perhaps likely that Doseos group had a different primary social connection than the larger Yahweh group. It's also quite possible that the multi-ethnic in composition uh, as well, unlike the large one. Paul in Acts provides evidence of a similar institutional phenomena in Acts 18, the house of the God-fearing Gentile Tidius Justice, which Luke says was just next door to the Corinthian Sunaguge, seemed to have become a gathering place for Paul and his Corinthian Christ followers, who were at the same time attached to the Sunaguge. It's possible then that this Christ association, which comprised of Jews and non-Jews, had been formed as a subgroup of a larger synagogue. So did Paul expect his Gentiles to continue going to synagogue? In light of what we just covered and allowing for the segmentary grammar to guide our thinking, we may suggest the following. Paul's Gentiles formed a discernible, uh, discernible groups whose primary social connection was Christ devotion. They formed associations designated ecclesiae and had their own membership structure and finances. Our question then is, did Paul intend for these Gentile Christ groups to remain attached to associations whose primary social connection was Yahweh worship, or not necessarily Christ worship, or whether he intended uh, that they disaffiliate 
from them, as Watson suggests. In Acts, Paul himself encountered opposition within some Yahweh associations. We get no sense, though, that this was the case everywhere, or that it was a result of some sort of systemic or superlocal persecution. In Paul's days, there was no superlocal synagogue authority that standardized halakha. Furthermore, association synagogues did not appear to have metered out discipline, such as floggings that Paul described that he received in 2 Corinthians 11.24. These floggings were localized incidents in Jerusalem. Romans 11 might suggest that Paul's Gentiles there were tempted to disassociate with the larger Jewish community from which he had originally they had been originally recruited. This sort of disassociation seems to be precisely what Paul attempts to prevent. Three features in Paul's letters indicate he expected his non-Jews to continue participating in their local Yahweh associations. First, Paul's not interested in his Gentiles remaining mere God fears. He wanted them to only offer cult to the God of Israel, 1 Thessalonians 1 9. This demand as Paula Fredrickson has noted, is fundamentally a Judaizing demand, and one that assumes a continued link between Paul's Gentiles and the larger Jewish community. This wasn't unheard of. Philo speaks of four-skinned Gentiles among Jewish groups who have alienated themselves from Polytheos and honor the one and only father of all things. It seems rather that Paul's desire to see god fears converted into exclusive worshipers of the Jewish God by means of their being in Christ is a natural outworking of his expectation that they would continue participating in association synagogues that had Yahweh devotion as its principal social connection. Second feature that suggests Paul expected Gentile Christ followers to remain within their larger Yahweh association is a scriptural argument. Nanos has observed that, Paul, uh, that Paul's argument, particularly as set forth in Romans, presupposes not only competence in the contents of Jewish scripture, but regular exposure to them in social settings in which scriptural texts were read, translated, and interpreted. It seems more likely that his Gentile Christ followers would have continued receiving instruction in Jewish scriptures from their local Yahweh associations and Christ-oriented instruction in their subgroup gatherings. This is when that would be another example of the segmentary logic of identity. Third feature in Paul's instruction is keeping the commandments of God in 1 Corinthians 7, 19. Following Nanos, Paul might not want his Gentiles to become Jews, but he certainly wants them to become Jewish. For Paul to expect Gentiles to maintain a Jewish identity, to envision a socio-religious setting for that identity to be cultivated and shaped around Jewish teachings for Gentiles. Which commands that Paul have in view here? Well, it's not clear. Surely they include the standards of behavior as described in the Decalogue, Romans 13, 8 to 10, perhaps Leviticus 17 and 18 in regard to idolatry or some sort of Noachide laws or righteousness for Gentiles. In 1 Corinthians 5:8. Paul encourages his Gentiles to celebrate the festival, that is, Passover with Christ as their Telpasca. It's possible that Paul nevertheless envisions a real ritual practice in which these Gentiles do celebrate the Passover with imbued messianic significance. Additionally, in Romans 14, Paul seems to treat Gentile observance of Jewish holidays and food halakha as a viable way of life for Christ followers who seek to honor God. These observant Gentiles are the ones that Paul especially expected to continue participating in the ritual life of their local Yahweh associations. Placing Paul's group within the association type of synagogues opens up new interpretive possibilities. As Anders Winnison has argued, this institutional setting drives the production of Paul's theology. The theoretical resources found in the segmentary grammar of identity leads to the construction of theology, as Paul observes in Christ Gentiles worshiping with Jews in the synagogues as members from the nations, the eschatological pilgrimage tradition begins to emerge in its theologizing. Donaldson comments that those part of the Paulitan Judaism approach are unanimous in drawing on eschatological pilgrimage expectations in understanding Paul's gospel or the status of the ethnic of Christ. Matthew Novison rejects uh, the idea that this approach guided Paul's conception of the Gentiles, since, he, since Paul never cites the key passages, Isaiah 2, Micah 4, Zechariah 8. Uh, Paulitan Judaism interpreters have failed to address the idea that all three aspects of the tradition need to be present, eschatology, pilgrimage, and Gentiles, for it to be clear that Paul relied on this tradition. So for this presentation, I'm only going to comment on one passage because I'm about out of time. Novison claims Paul does not cite from this tradition. Okay, I agree. I cry uncle. There you go, uh, Matt. So let me try uh, another way at this then. Uh, there is a citation of Isaiah 11.10 in Romans 15.12, but he uses this as an example that lacks pilgrimage, citing Robert's 
showing it should be excluded from the tradition. The reason Paul cites Isaiah 11.10 and not 2.5 and Romans 15.12 uh, is because there is messianic eschatological subjection of the nations, but not eschatological pilgrims of the Gentiles to Zion. However, the oracles in Isaiah 2.4 and 11.3.4 both include a righteous ruler and 11.5-9 describe his knowledge filling the earth. Even Roberts acknowledges that 11.10 parallels closely the vision of 2.2-5, though again the nations go to the root of Jesse instead of the divine mountain. This may be a case, though, of a metonymy, where in that day the root Jesse, which remains standing, will be like a flag for the peoples, can stand as a reference for the city, in which case there is pilgrimage there. Even if the focus is on the king and not the city, the city is not ignored. In verse 10, and his resting, resting place will be glorious. In Psalm 132, 14, the resting place is Zion, God's eternal abode. It's likely then that Romans 15, 12, with the citation of Isaiah 11:10 does have all three components, eschatology, pilgrimage, and Gentiles. We suggest that Galatians 4.27, citation of Isaiah 54.1, and the Jerusalem collection can also be read to support the, the idea that eschatological, eschatology, pilgrimage, and Gentiles are present, and support the idea that the continuing association synagogue context drives the development of Paul's theology. Conclusion. Michael Bird's orienting call has proven helpful in clarifying our thinking on three important issues. First, through the recognition of the segmentary identity grammar, we were able to uncover the way in Christ Gentiles could remain distinct as Gentiles at one level of their identity while being included in an Israel-like identity at another level. Second, it was discovered that recent work in Greco-Roman associations provides historical justification for claiming that Paul expected these ex-pagan Gentiles to still go to synagogue, attending Christ associations within larger Yahweh associations. And third, we briefly address whether the eschatological pilgrimage tradition informed Paul's theologizing by suggesting the future identity for the nations worshiping with Israel calls for a continuing distinction between the groups. While there's more to do in relation to the contra, intra, and bridge perspective, these three points at least address reoccurring criticisms of the Paul within Judaism perspective. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Brian. Um, I'll hand over now to David. I can't see if David's around. Does David have any uh, questions or comments for Brian? Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, Brian, I love the paper. Really enjoyed reading it. Found it hugely stimulating. Um, I love the use you make of Bauman and Gingrich, um, and I think that might give us some the, the sort of uh, conceptual and rhetorical flexibility or conceptual flexibility we need for what Paul's doing rhetorically, I think, in constructing identity for Christ believers. I um, was really intrigued by, continue to be intrigued by the arguments that you make for the likelihood of Christ believers, Gentile Christ believers participating in association type synagogues. I've got to think my way through that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I can see a real possibility that as that a, as a social location within which Paul does his theologizing. Um, but I guess I, um, the, the place where your paper came closest to my own interest was in the last bit. Um, and uh, uh, without wanting to steal um, any of Matthew's thunder, I'm sure he'll have some things to say. Um, I guess I remain at this stage still quite not yet convinced by the, the weight that you place on the eschatological pilgrimage texts in Isaiah and Zechariah um, as resources for Paul to draw on in, um, in constructing the identity and the place of Gentile Christ believers. Um, I guess particularly, um, it's, it felt to me like each of the texts that you discussed in the longer the version of the paper involved a bit of a reach on your part. So, you know, in Isaiah 11, 10, the, the, the reference at the end of the verse to the resting place, the glorious resting place, which I take it, yeah, of, of course, it seems to me as a, as a Zion reference, but it's precisely the part of the verse that Paul doesn't carry over into Romans 15. Um, so you've got to make some sort of um, appeal to metalepsis there, I guess. But it, it would be intriguing if the pilgrimage was what was in the front of Paul's mind, the most salient feature of that text for him, why he doesn't bring that bit over. That would seem curious. Um, in Isaiah 54, 1, um, I, I'm, I'm struggling to read that as an eschatological pilgrimage text. There's a lot 
a lot of eschatological pilgrimages elsewhere in Isaiah, I grant, but there, you know, what happens with the nations is a, a restored Zion um, possesses and settles the desolate cities of the nations. You know, Zion expands out into Gentile territory. I don't see pictures of Gentile pilgrims bringing tribute to Zion in Isaiah 54 or Gentile pilgrims coming to become worshippers in Zion. Um, and what Zion's promised is not pilgrims, but children um, whom the Galatian Christ believers pick, become um, children of the desolate woman. Um, and then in 2 Corinthians 8, um, in connection with the the you know, collection for the the saints in, in Jerusalem, um, yeah, the the reference to the present time um, is language that Paul elsewhere uses with eschatological reference. But here, I would have thought the more natural reading of that is that he's he's talking about the present immediate present circumstances in which Corinthian prosperity can fund the relief of um, the poor in in Jerusalem. Um, and anticipating implicitly, uh, you know, a, a possible future time in which that that um, equal sharing might might involve a, a flow of generosity the other way. Um, so it doesn't feel to me like the context suggests um, eschatology or or pilgrimage. And indeed, if anything, the picture that Paul goes on to quote when he does actually quote Old Testament in that argument there in verse in the following verse in verse fifteen is about a picture of equal distribution within one Israel um, as the the manna is uh, is shared equally uh, between the households um, so if anything with Richard Hayes I'd say that the this is not a strong argument but uh, but if anything what you got there is a, a kind of typological inclusion of the Gentiles within um, uh, an Israel community or an Israel-like community of equal sharing so I guess my question, in light of each of those places where it felt to me like the texts that you were appealing to um, involved quite a, a reach on your part, um, how much weight do you think eschatological pilgrimage traditions did carry for Paul? And um, to what extent were they placed alongside other scriptural resources that Paul could draw on? for constructing the identity of his Gentile Christ-believing converts and their relation to Israel and to Jewish Christ-believers. At this point, I want to say my audio is not working, so I can't respond, but I won't do that. Uh, this is what my students do in class. It's, it's always great when they do that. Uh, yeah, I, I just say, I, I'm glad, I'm glad, uh, Wonderful are the the wounds of a friend, and uh, and so Matt doesn't have to do it now. So I think that for me, uh, the because I, I look at this and I and I see the kind of just the assumption that those working with Paul was in Judaism that this is there, and I've been curious to see is it really there? And then uh, uh, Matt's original uh, Roslavia paper it was like, okay. So now I, I need to go back and look and see if I have just assumed that they're there. And, uh, and so I, I find that tension for me uh, in terms of uh, does, does Paul kind of already see the, the restoration of Israel uh, beginning? Uh, in which case then, you know, this anticipation of like in Romans 11, uh, 26 and uh, the Messiah coming uh, from Zion and those kind of things. And so, so, but then I would see the other arguments, and it and it just sent, uh, it created more uh, instability for me, and it made me kind of think, well, this is why uh, those within Paul and Judaism approach, generally speaking, just kind of set this aside. So, uh, so I, I, in that same conference uh, collection, I did a kind of critique on Hayes in terms of the use of that approach of that kind of metalepsis and that whole uh, framework. Because while it is not in and of itself um, one that would lead to a certain type of reading, uh, the presuppositions of the interpreter kind of contribute to, to that. So um, Joe Willits and, and others have talked about narratology uh, as a way to think about the way these earlier uh, citations 
uh, can are, are brought into uh, the the argument there, and uh, and so uh, so I would say yeah I mean those there I, I didn't think about it in terms of a reach because uh, I'm getting ready to grade a whole bunch of hermeneutics papers and so I'll I'll be saying this is a reach and uh, it would be great for me um, so I I think with regard to uh, the Galatians one um, you know especially because you know you've done pretty significant work uh, on that I'll uh, uh, I won't try to argue, uh, but I might say something based on your paper later. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, if the, the degree to which Israel's restoration is part of that. Um, in terms of the Jerusalem collection, I think when I start seeing these, I start thinking that what are we, what are we responding to? We're responding to the idea that Jerusalem no, no longer matters to Paul. And, and so whether this is the way somebody reads Romans 4.13, uh, and, uh, you know, those, those types of issues in terms of what is the nature of, uh, so like Josh uh, mentioned earlier, uh, his question in terms of what are the nature of these promises uh, that were there and how do we navigate uh, those, and especially as they're uh, being redeployed uh, for uh, these uh, small uh, subgroups. And uh, so, so maybe the question that is not, is it the pilgrimage tradition or not? Because I, I'd want to maintain that Jerusalem is still center of the world for Paul and that there's glory to be found in Jerusalem. Um, you know, e even uh, in, in the paper where I say, when we can, can we talk about this in terms of a, a re-centering rather than a just a, a setting away from the temple? Uh, because it's from there that the Savior is going to come. Yes. So I just think there's something I want to do with that. And, um, and, and it could be um, an, an overreach and not paying attention to uh, what, what those texts are actually saying uh, uh, that, uh, that create some of the challenge. So whether they're explicit citations or allusions or echoes, um, it, it, it may not matter too much within the uh, the Paulson Judaism uh, approach, and maybe that's why uh, some of my colleagues uh, don't try to jump into this question and address it. Um, but I, I would suggest it's at least one of the images or scenarios that was floating around, um, and I know that gets gets quite subjective at that point. I would resonate uh, with other Jewish writers in the period, and uh, and so so maybe. Um, that's probably where I should I should leave it. Uh, mm. Your points are, are well taken, and, and I, I really appreciate them. One thing, if I could just jump in, one thing I might want to, want to I, I give back as a thank you gift, um, and you may well have spotted this already, but just just to highlight the fact that Paul's contrast in Galatians four is not between Jerusalem above and Jerusalem below, but between Jerusalem above and present Jerusalem, um, which I think says something in itself. And uh, mm -hmm. placed next to second Baruch and fourth Baruch and so on, um, places where you get heavenly Jerusalem or Jerusalem above, um, that's often pregnant with implications for future Jerusalem below. Mm -hmm. um, because stuff gets built on earth according to the template of Jerusalem above. And when Jerusalem below, present Jerusalem below gets destroyed, there's hope for Jerusalem below's future in yeah. what is shown in the vision of Jerusalem above. Mm. So that, that might be uh, mm. a line worth inquiring into. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks for that. I might speak in your defense, Brian. I would say the eschatological pilgrimage of the uh, Gentiles uh, may not be a reach, but I think it, it, it's within reach because <laughs> um, in restoration eschatology, once Israel is restored in whatever form, there's always some kind of sequel that involves the Gentiles. Now that's played out differently in Zechariah 8 and in other places. Uh, in addition to that, it's also then interpreted or even translated differently between the Masoretic text and Septuagint. You've only got to look at you know, the end of you know, Amos 9 to see the big differences that plays out. You've got the big theme of you know, a light to the Gentiles, which seems to be uh, ubiquitous uh, in Christian literature um, from the Gospels, um, Luke Acts, obviously, I think it's a little bit of John all the way through to Justin Martyr making a, a big theme of this. 
And you could argue a passage like Romans 15, where Christ became a servant to the circumcised uh, to confirm the promises on, on behalf of the, the, of the patriarchs, that is kind of tapping into that sort of restorationist eschatology for which there is an implication for the Gentile world. So when Israel is restored, the Gentiles are not left untouched. So Paul is not necessarily citing Isaiah 2, 2 to 4, or 66 or Zechariah 8, but that, but that macro, that structure of Jew then Gentile uh, is certainly very embedded. And that was one element of the restorationist um, eschatology um, as it gets played out in a, in, a, in a lot of, in both in the Hebrew and Greek Bible, a lot of Jewish literature, and then also becomes very important early Christianity. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I, I noticed Matt's, Matt's probably got an opinion on this, so I'll um, hand over to Matt at this point. Uh, thanks very much, Brian. Uh, I really like the paper. I think your insistence on the point that Paul still considers Jerusalem uh, center of the world is more, uh, I think that's quite right. And I think your emphasis on Romans 11, that the Romanos mm -hmm. comes from Zion, I think that's absolutely important. So yeah, I, I, uh, and so I'm very much with you against uh, uh, sort of trends in the field that say he just sort of spiritualizes away the holy city or something like that. <laughs> so my question is just whether he thinks that pneumatic Gentiles are supposed to go there, right? That's the question. Uh, and um, so in relation to your paper, I suppose the question I'd put is this. Uh, I'm really interested in, curious to, uh, about the relation of the former part of the paper to the latter. So that you're, you're a bit on the eschatological pilgrimage and then your kind of sociological argument about subgroups in the synagogues. So the question, I guess, is, is it a problem for your overall argument that the, the way in which Paul's Gentiles make pilgrimage is essentially, I mean, they don't go to Zion at all. They go to the synagogue in Rome or Ephesus or, uh, does that count as pilgrimage to Zion? If, <laughs> right, if in fact, they're just kind of going to, their local house of study is, I mean, that, then it's not that, yeah, does that fall short of, uh, you know, the, the, the glory of the prophetic oracles, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you first said it, I thought, well, we could at least say, in terms of pilgrimage, their money's going to, uh, so it's kind of like tourism, but that wouldn't really be a good argument, so, um, yeah, I, I think, I think you're right, I mean, so the evidence, if we had it for um, not just not just a collection going, and even though I mentioned, well, it could be a mixed ethnic group uh, that's taking taking the money uh, to to Jerusalem. That's still a pretty small, you know, uh, number that, that, that doesn't seem to align with even what those texts were, were laying out. Um, I, I I I did feel uh, for the last. Uh, few days um, thinking about the association within an association and what what could could that even look like uh, in in the land of Israel compared to uh, you know the um, the diaspora ones that we're talking about and um, and, and that seems that's where the challenges would be and that's you know uh, that's the idea that floggings occur the flogging that Paul gets gets probably in, in Israel rather than in, in a diaspora one. Uh, is, is that an example of him trying to attempt to do that? And so it, maybe it isn't working. Um, so uh, so it, it, uh, it, it does feel like um, that, that the uh, sociological framework can't, can't go there to the degree that I would like it to. What a, one, one follow-up. What do you think about, uh, I mean, I remember that Bert Harrell argues this, and I, I think a couple other people have mentioned it, but right, that, that the Trophimus, the Ephesian story at the end of Acts, it's presented in Acts as a rumor, but it's, the, it's God's honest truth. Paul took a Gentile and dragged him across, uh, right, in, into the holy precincts because he had to bring about this pilgrimage, and so he did it. And mm -hmm. Acts is sort of, you know, making it out to be a rumor but in fact it's what happened do you reckon well would you put any stock in that 
reading? Or do you, do you think it's the kind of thing, if, Paul, if, if, if Paul's bought into this eschatological pilgrimage idea, that he wants to actually get Gentiles in Christ to Mount Zion? So uh, I uh, had sent, I had my, uh, my Asaph moment from Psalm 73. I was beginning to slip. I had to get into the, uh, the sanctuary. I emailed Mike and I said, hey, I got this other paper on Ephesians 2. I think I want to do. And, uh, and it actually addressed part of that. And uh, because in terms of what are we doing with two, uh, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, in terms of the balustrade and is this the dividing wall? Is that what Paul has in mind uh, there? So he sees that as the mother of all human traditions. And so that, so in that sense, if it is keeping Gentiles from the God of Israel, then, then uh, that would, I could see that happening. Uh, I think Josh, yes, or Ryan yesterday mentioned uh, Paul been converted from his, zealot, his, his zealousness. Uh, you know, so maybe, maybe there's a tension there in terms of that. If, if he's saying, okay, that's how I, that's kind of like with what Jewett did with his Romans come. That's what he used to do. Now he's not going to do that anymore um, uh, in, in that sense. But uh, I mean, even, you know, um, I think Schnabel talks a, a bit about that in his, in his Acts commentary as well. And it's, and it's like, well, yeah. Um, but uh, it, I mean, without, without uh, being, being able to edit myself later, uh, I, I would say um, that that rings true uh, to me. That that kind of uh, uh, and, it, and, it, and if that's in and it, so I was intrigued with Josh was earlier talking about the way Paul was working through these things himself and coming with that and uh, uh, just just kind of the way that I I, I I guess I do my life as well. Uh, and then I get to the end and go, yeah, that's exactly how I meant all along. Uh, and uh, so um, so yeah so. So that's probably where I'd go with that. Um, but that's a that's a pretty good example of what that might look like. We we'll probably need to uh, move on to um, our next presenter. So uh, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, giving us your uh, paper. Much to think about there. Um, we now have uh, handing over to uh, another fellow Australian, uh, David. Now I think David, you just shared a file. Um, yeah, the paper some... that. I, that... I gave to you um, is a fuller version and what I'll present today is, is abbreviated. So I've just what sent through in the chat, a version that marks up the bits I'll skip if, that, if that's helpful, if people are wanting to follow along. Good, for a second there, I thought you were about to repudiate the paper you submitted and say, you know, I, I repent, oh, my, I repent. My feet slip, but not that much, yes. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I'll hand over to you, David. Thanks, Mike. Um, within the closing verses of Galatians, amidst the settling dust from the urgent polemical argument that has occupied most of the preceding chapters, Paul pronounces an ironically worded benediction framed in sweeping and forward-looking language. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. The meaning of the first half of the benediction, as for those who will follow this rule, is relatively easy to discern, with this rule generally taken as referring back to the principle Paul has stated in the immediately preceding verse, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. And those who will follow, embracing within, within its scope, all those, whether Jewish or Gentile, among the followers of Christ, who commit to shaping their conduct in accordance with that rule. The benediction's second half, however, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God, has given wise rise to a wide variety of scholarly interpretations, implying various different construals of the relationship between Paul's Gentile majority churches and the story of Israel. Some interpreters, uh, Lou Martin, uh, Martin de Boer, and others, uh, read Paul's benediction almost entirely against the near horizon of the immediate crisis in Galatia, and only indirectly, if at all, in relation to any larger story of Israel, Christ, and the Gentiles. Um, I'll skip the bit where I respond to uh, that particular take. Um, but most interpreters correctly, I think, do relate the benediction in 6 verse 16 to uh, the larger story of Israel, Christ, and the Gentiles as Paul reconfigures that story in light of the Christ event, doing so in the majority of cases in one of two main ways. The first reads Paul's invocation of a blessing on the Israel of God as referring to the church, including both Jews and Gentiles who have given their allegiance to Jesus as Messiah 
and walk by the rule Paul has laid down in the previous verse. And uh, on that reading, understand the final chi in the verse as epigenetical in its function, um, even upon the Israel of God. On this reading, Paul is taken to be pronouncing a single benediction on those who will follow this rule, describing them in the final phrase as even the Israel of God. The alternative interpretation of verse 16 reads the Israel of God as referring to ethnic Israel and understands the, understands the chi as joining together two parallel benedictions, one on the church and the other on those to whom this phrase refers. Some of those who argue for this interpretation do so on the assumption that the fulfillment of Paul's wish prayer will be contingent on national ethnic Israel's future embrace of Jesus as Messiah, uh, whereas others read it as presupposing a separate path that's open for Israel to follow under the mercy of God, but without any necessity of faith in Jesus as Messiah. Deciding between these two alternative interpretations of the intended meaning and reference of the Israel of God within Paul's benediction is far from easy. In favour of the first is the vigour with which Paul, within the previous chapters of the letter, has argued for the full inclusion of uncircumcised Gentile believers among the justified people of God and the heirs of his promises. If neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, and the Galatian believers are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, children of the true, heavenly, restored, future Jerusalem, then it is entirely possible that Paul might go on in the final verses of the letter to include them among the group that he speaks of as even the Israel of God, restored and reconfigured around the Messiah, Jesus. Given the rhetorical situation Paul is addressing in Galatians and the prominence in his readers' minds of the immediate presenting issue raised by the counter-missionaries demand that they be circumcised, a move of this sort in the letter's final verses has an obvious fittingness. All things considered, I think it is probably to be preferred as the more likely account of how Paul intended his benediction to be understood by the original hearers of the letter as it was read within the assemblies of Galatia. But as advocates of the alternative interpretation rightly point out, the immediate question to be answered by Paul's readers in Galatia may not necessarily have been the only question on Paul's mind as he wrote to them. Important as it was for them to come to an understanding of their own status in relation to the story of Israel, Paul can hardly have been oblivious to the importance of the related question of how they and he should understand the present status of national ethnic Israel in view of God's turn in mercy toward the Gentiles. Whilst the arguments Paul has made across the previous chapters of the letter are focused primarily on the battle he's fighting for the inclusion of Gentiles among the people of God, it is difficult to imagine him making them without any consciousness on his part of the gravity of what was at stake for his fellow Jews who remained outside of Christ and for the nation of Israel collectively. It's to questions of that sort that Paul turns in Romans 9 to 11, uh, addressing a mixed audience of Jewish and Gentile readers and pursuing an interrelated set of pastoral and apologetic purposes that include both a defense of Gentile inclusion and a rebuke of Gentile boasting. He commences the discussion with an emphatic and rhetorically prominent expression of his own personal anguish over the issue. Paul's anguish over the situation of Israel is not only an expression of the fact that they are his kindred, verse three, or of his empathetic identification with their plight. It's exacerbated by the convictions that he holds regarding their identity as the covenant people of God. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. Verse 4. The nation of Israel, according to Paul, are the people to whom the promises of God were originally given. If they are cut off, then questions arise about the trustworthiness of God himself. For much of chapters 9 to 11, as Paul addresses these questions, the answer that he gives seems to hold out little hope for the majority of ethnic Israel. Paul's assertion in verse 6 that it is not as though the word of God has failed is supported in the immediately, immediately following verses by a reminder that not all Israelites truly belong to Israel. Israel, Israel. And it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise. 
a series of biblical examples follows, illustrating this principle and affirming the freedom of God to have mercy on whomever he chooses and harden the heart of whomever he chooses. In verses 22 to 24, Paul poses a shocking rhetorical question. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make, his known, make known his power, has endured with much patience the objects of wrath that are made for destruction? And what if he has done so in order to make known the riches of his glory for the objects of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, including us whom he has called, not only from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles? The implication of the question is hard to miss. If it turns out to be the case that national Israel was nothing more than an object of wrath made for destruction in order to serve as part of a divine plan directed toward the salvation of others, uh, Christ believers, Jewish and Gentile, then even that would be within the rights of God the creator. After all, as Paul has just asserted, the potter has the right to make whatever he wishes out of the clay. The immediate impression conveyed by the verses, verses that follow at first reading is that this is indeed what God has done. Gentiles who were once not my people have been called my people. And Israel, in a manner analogous to the judgment prophesied in Isaiah 10, 22, has been re reduced to a tattered remnant. In the paragraphs that follow, Paul mulls over the reasons why Israel stumbled over the stumbling stone, concluding with a gloomy image drawn from Isaiah of the nation of Israel as a disobedient and contrary people. In the opening verses of chapter 11, the image of stumbling resurfaces, and Paul turns to the question of whether Israel's rejection is final and irreversible. He puts the question twice with deliberate repetition. I ask then, has God rejected his people? Verse 1. So I ask, verse 11, have they stumbled so as to fall? Both times, the answer he gives is the same. By no means. May genoita. But the arguments with which he supports these two emphatic denials differ. In the first instance, within verses 1 to 10, his answer is a reiteration of the earlier arguments about the remnant of Paul's own day. Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. But the second answer in verses 11 to 32 is more ambitious, pushing beyond the preservation of a remnant in the present to a larger and more audacious hope. The depiction of jealous Israel in verses 11 to 15 draws on an image already evoked in 10 verse 2 and 19 as part of an argument for Israel's culpability. Now, however, that same jealousy is portrayed as a force through which Paul hopes that salvation will come to some, verse 14, within Israel. I hope flanked by even more optimistic references to the fullness of Israel, verse 12, and an acceptance that will amount to life from the dead, verse 15. In support of this hope, the twin analogies of the first fruits and the batch of dough and the root and branches in verse 16 echo the arguments from scripture about the remnant of Israel in the preceding chapters and now uncover their latent implications for the rest of the nation. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the batch is holy. And if the root is holy, then the branches also are holy. Likewise, the olive tree metaphor in verses 17 to 24 begins by recalling the various quotations from scripture in chapter 9, 6 to eleven ten, concerning the judgments of God on hardened Israel and the inclusion of Gentile believers in the place they once occupied. Branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place. Now, however, having spoken in chapters 9 to 10 about the way in which Gentiles were grafted by grace into the fulfillment of promises not originally given to them, Paul makes explicit the question of whether, by the same grace, the natural branches that were pruned off because of unbelief could be granted back into the fulfillment of the same promises. In the verses that follow, the original reference of the language of the restoration of Israel promises, in this case, Isaiah 59, 20 and 27, 9, reasserts itself emphatically. The picture Paul paints within these verses does not necessarily, I think, imply an expectation of each and every Israelite embracing salvation in or apart from Christ, but it does, however, require the inclusion of a sufficient proportion 
of those who are currently hardened and outside the believing remnant to constitute what Paul describes as a fullness of Israel, verse 12, comparable with the fullness of the Gentiles, verse 25, and an acceptance which when compared with their current rejection stands out as nothing less than life from the dead, verse 15. The phrase all Israel that Paul uses in verse 26 may well include the Gentiles of verses 17 to 24 who were grafted in while the majority of Israel were hardened. Paul never specifies explicitly whether the olive tree into which they were grafted stands for the family of Abraham, the people of the Messiah, the enlarged and expanded Israel of the last days, or some combination of all of the above. But regardless of whether Paul's reference to all Israel in verse 26 is taken as referring to a Gentile inclusive or an exclusively Jewish body, the larger arc of his ideas across verses 11 to 32 clearly implies a future for ethnic Israel that includes far more than the preservation of a tiny remnant of Jewish Christ believers within or alongside a Gentile majority church. In choosing the texts that he quotes in verses 26 to 27, Paul seems to have deliberately selected texts that speak of Israel's salvation, not as deliverance from Gentiles, but as a deliverance from ungodliness and sins in terms that emphasize the divine initiative in bringing about Israel's final repentance. This focus prepares the way for the emphasis on mercy in verses 30 to 32, as the key to God's mysterious workings among Israel and the Gentiles. As Paul draws together the threads of this whole section in these verses, suggesting that God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all, verse 32, he recalls the similar formulations in 520 to 21 and 319 to 24. Um, while so much of the energy of Romans 9 to 11 has been expended on the task of tracing the different paths of Israel and the Gentiles within the purposes of God, Paul's summary at the end of this section of the argument suggests not only a final convergence between the two paths, but also a kind of paradoxical symmetry, which he expresses in the complex formulations of verses 30 and 31. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may receive mercy. Read within the context of this complex, gradually unfolding argument, Paul's use of the Hosea quotations in verses 25 to 26 of chapter 9 regarding the mercy of God to those who are not my people fulfills two primary functions, both of which contribute to his overall aims in the letter. In the first place, Within the immediate purposes of the argument in verses 22 to 29 of chapter 9, Paul makes use of the Hosea quotations typologically to show the correspondences between the calling of the Gentiles in the gospel and the mercy promised to Israel when Israel's betrayal of the covenant was such that it had rendered her capable of being described as not my people. This first typological use of the Hosea texts fits within a larger hermeneutical pattern in which Paul appropriates not texts originally referring to Israel and applies them to the Gentiles as part of the still larger pattern within Romans in which Israel's story of sin, exile and redemption is presented as corresponding typologically with the idolatry, judgment and salvation of the Gentiles. At the same time, within the larger argument of Romans 9 to 11, Paul's use of the Hosea quotations hints at the questions they raise for the future destiny of an Israel that is still or once more in a kind of typological exile and an exile that corresponds to the impending plight of the Israel Hosea originally described as not my people to whom the promise of restoration was originally given. Given the prominence of those questions within chapters 9 to 11 and the way in which Paul resolves them in 11 verses 11 to 32, it is most unlikely that this second function of the quotations bound up with the original contextual reference of Hosea's words to the nation of Israel is completely obliterated by the former typological appropriation of the promises. If the only salvation for Gentile believers is through being grafted into God's people by faith in promises originally given to a people who had been cut off for unbelief, then they have no right to boast over the branches that were cut off to make room for them 
or to assume that the branches cut off as not my people cannot be grafted back in by the same kindness of God that was extended to them as Gentiles. The multiple layers of significance that Paul perceived within Israel's story for Gentile believers in Galatia and Rome require a complicated set of answers to the questions raised by the Paul within Judaism conversation that is the theme of this symposium. Three um, uh, brief concluding thoughts from me um, in relation to those issues. First, the invitation that Paul's gospel extended to uncircumcised Gentiles to be justified in Christ by faith and not by works of the law was also extended on the same terms to his fellow Jews, in Galatians 2, 15 to 16, Galatians 3, 23 to 4, 7, Romans 3, 21 to 31. Paul's convictions on this matter were informed not only by the Gentile inclusive promises originally given to Abraham and the outpouring of the spirit on Gentile believers in Christ, but also by the correspondences that he perceived between Israel's story of sin, exile and redemption and the distinct but analogous story of the idolatry, judgment and salvation of Gentile believers. Gentiles can become my people because Israel has first become not my people. The Gentiles become Christ's not by being grafted through the law into the branches of a flourishing, obedient Israel, but by being granted, grafted through the new covenant promises of the prophets into the stump from which the branches of disobedient Israel have been broken. Second, Paul's convictions regarding the relativization of circumcision and the full inclusion of Gentile believers in Christ make it possible, though by no means certain, that his intended meaning in Galatians 6.16 was one that included them within the scope of the Israel of God on which he pronounces his benediction. Similarly, in Romans 11:26, the eschatological community of all Israel, whose salvation he looks forward to at the end of the age, may well be referring to an expanded and enlarged Israel that includes within its boundaries the Gentiles who have been grafted in through faith in Christ while the majority of Israel was hardened. But thirdly, nevertheless, in Paul's view, the inclusion of uncircumcised Gentiles within the people of Christ, and probably also within the Israel he refers to in Galatians 6.16 and Romans 11.26, does not mean that the future of ethnic and possibly even national Israel has become an irrelevance to Paul's gospel or a dead end in salvation history as he, as he reads it. Just as the disobedience of Israel has opened a door of salvation to the Gentiles, so also the mercy that God has extended to the Gentiles will one day return as salvation for Israel. In the end, as Paul narrates them, the two distinct but intertwined stories of Israel and the Gentiles converge within a single larger story of God and his mercy to all. And it is that story with the stories of Israel and the Gentiles nested as subplots within it that forms the basis for the exhortations that conclude the letter in verses 12 to 16, chapters 12 to 16 of Romans. Excellent. Thank you very much, David. Uh, thanks for, for bringing us home on that paper. Uh, I'll now hand over to uh, Brian for his uh, revenge, I mean, sorry, response um, uh, to what he wants to say to uh, any questions he has for David on that? I thought I thought he might have a few, maybe especially on the Israel of God question. Um, so I'll hand over to you, uh, Brian. Thanks, uh, David. Thanks for this. Uh, I have nothing that I disagree with. This is amazing. So, uh, so we've we've solved it. We've become the bridge. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking earlier today. It was is our starting point. Uh, get us to a certain place. Um, my doctoral supervisor, you know, Bill Campbell, would always tell the story about somebody in Ireland was trying to get to Dublin <laughs> and they couldn't really understand. And he said, if I were you, I wouldn't start here. <laughs> it's like, okay, so that was uh, really helpful. Um, so, so one thing I'm wondering about uh, in terms of uh, the Israel of God is if, if, um, if Gentiles can be uh, included in in that group uh why why make the argument that gentile identity matters in galatians just in general uh, yeah look first i have to say um 
I'm, I'm in, in the process, still in the process of persuading myself to an opinion on Galatians 6.16 and Romans 11.26. And it wasn't the opinion I thought I'd arrive at when I started writing the paper. So uh, I'm feeling kind of tentatively attached to the, the, the reading there. Um, it does seem like um, there's, there's a, there's a I, I don't think there's a rhetorically inert category descriptions that Paul uses here. Um, uh, so I think, and, and I think he's, he's drawing on the rhetorical resources of the prophets, um, who can say things like Egypt, my people, or, um, the Egyptians are uncircumcised and Israel's uncircumcised, um, and, and so on. So there can be rhetorical plays made with language of these kind of identity describing insider and outsider group terms, um, that are situation specific and relate to a particular, so, so you know, um, Gentiles can be Israel and not Israel, depending on what, what, what the context is. They, they can be Gentiles and not Gentiles, as, uh, as uh, Joshua was saying at the start of the morning. Um, so, yeah, I think when Paul's got an eye on the future, that's when he's most likely to use um, the um, Gentile inclusive um, language about Israel, I think. So the blessing is forward looking. Um, um it's it's those who yeah and and certainly Romans eleven twenty six. it's all israel and it's a it's the future constitution of all israel so i don't see paul finding a comfortable present place in an empirical israel for uncircumcised gentiles um but he sees them as inheritors which again is a concept that's pregnant with futurity <laughs> Uh, fellow heirs with Israel, it's complicated. And I think there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's a kind of inaugurated eschatology at work here. Yeah, I was even reminded, even the, the quote that I used from uh, Mike's work earlier, the part that I left off is needed to resolve the Israel of God and has Paul devalued the election of Israel and those kind of things. And so uh, I started that paper and it ended up in the bin. Uh, so I want to want to move to the uh, the, the, the section uh, dealing with uh, Romans nine twenty five and twenty six mm -hmm. and 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 uh, the Hosea con Hosea in context. Uh, so so the idea that Paul draws from this tradition of, of this kind of some kind of correspondence between the identity of the Gentiles and those described as not my people, that kind of thing. So uh, the transformation of identity. Uh, that occurs and in Christ Gentiles are now part of God's people. Uh, but doesn't this suggest that those in Christ Gentiles have taken over uh, the identity of Israel at that point? I don't think so. I don't think it's quite the, the move that Paul's making. Um, so I think his, his rhetoric, his argument is analogical at that point. Um, and, and it's one of a string of analogies. Well, his argument, it's, it's at one level, what he's doing in Romans nine is stringing together analogies at another level. He's sequencing them chronologically. Uh, so it's narratival as well as analogical. Um, uh, but yes, I don't think, so I think in, in, um, uh, I, th so I think Gentiles are not my people just as the Israel addressed by Hosea are called not by people. Mm -hmm. And just as the Israel that has been called not my people can once again one day be called my people, uh, according to Hosea, so also Gentiles who are not my people can be called my people. Mm -hmm. So I don't think Israel gets kind of pushed out of the way by Paul's um, analogy that he draws there, but Israel is, Gentiles are invited back in in company with an exiled and scattered Israel who are coming back. So God doesn't just restore the exiles of Israel. He restores, they, they've become Hosea 7. They've become, if Ephraim become all become mixed up with the nations in a sense and, in, and calling the exiles home it involves the same kind of movement of grace that calls the Gentiles in. Uh, that's what I think is going on. Yeah, that, that's helpful. So, um, so you're kind of suggesting that there's that, the typology is working and generally you know typology is kind of laid out as the <clears throat> the interpretive move 
that leads to the traditional reading compared to any kind of um, uh, revised yeah. re readings. Yes, I don't um, think Paul's a, I don't think, I, I don't read Paul as being a kind of a, um, an unreconstructed supersessionist at all. Right, right. Yeah, yeah so, so, um, so from, from um, the promise fulfillment is, how, how do you, how would you describe then? There's a, so for example, I'm thinking of like Bolton's paradigm rendition, you know, as a way to, to kind of overall, I mean, I know your bigger project is about, is about the hermeneutical use of these texts. And, uh, and I think that that's, you've laid out some frameworks that can help. And I'm just curious as to how you navigate kind of not becoming that kind of double, double fulfillment kind of uh, an approach. Yeah, look, I, I'm like, I think there are elements of promise fulfillment and elements of typological correspondence in how, what Paul does with the text. I, I think we've got to start with the, the phenomena of the, the uses that Paul makes case by case and then theorize up from there rather than try and find a single explanatory key, a single hermeneutical method um, and try and fit all Paul's uses of scripture into that one method, whether it's typological or promise fulfillment or, or whatever it, it is. I think Paul's eclectic. Um, and we just got to start with the variety of things, moves he makes. And I think we do have to allow for the possibility, assume, assume retention and reuse and collective communal interpretation of Paul's letters. I think he expects that his letters won't be immediately understood fully by all the hearers in the ecclesia on first hearing, um, grabbing the meaning of the text straight off the surface. Um, I think he, he assumes that there are Jewish Christ believers within the assemblies who are scripturally competent and the community have access to, to at least collections of portions of Israel's scriptures, um, that there are teachers, Galatians, um, he refers to, you know, within the in making sense of Paul's letters in the reading and rereading. So I think the idea that there are um, uh, layers of meaning um, and subtle allusions to scripture that one only picks up with the assistance of other more scripturally competent hearers um, or on second or third reading, I, th I think that's a plausible, um, a plausible assumption about the kind of use of scripture and the kind of use of Paul's letters that he intends. Uh, I think Ross Wagner and others have, have argued for that convincingly to my mind yeah the only other thing i mentioned in, in, in passing is a reminder of given's work where uh ancient perspectives on peoplehood and contemporary uh perspectives on peoplehood tend to get in the way of these kinds of discussions as well yeah yeah yep one thing okay. i um yeah um I, I guess one of the things I, I didn't get to say in the paper but probably should have said is it seems to me that amongst talking about the rhetorical um, constructions of identity in particular in relation to particular rhetorical situations you know in Paul's letters um, I think it's no accident that the resources he draws on are already also the, in the, the, the prophetic texts of the Old Testament especially they're, they're not rhetorically inert either so when he's drawing on Jeremiah or Isaiah or Isaiah um, those texts themselves have a rhetoric that destabilizes identity categories and Israel's own history of um, of exile and dispersion and return destabilize um, um, its own identity and connection with land um, within its own story is some of a good deal of the dynamism that Paul draws on in, in projecting further redefinitions. It, it's the um, the animation that um, uh, I think it was Joshua spoke about earlier. It, it's, it's not a picture. It's a it's an, a little animated film. Definitely. So Gentiles in Christ are returning exiles. Yep. That I don't think that's the only way in which Paul conceives of Gentile in Christ identity, but I think it's a, it's a particularly illuminating category that, that he draws upon amongst others for constructing their identity in relation to Israel. I think we've Thanks. got one question here from uh, Joshua. I think we've got time for one more question. So, uh, Joshua, you get to ask the final question. All right. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, David. A really open-ended question, just something I've wrestled with um, during the two days of this conference and in the past as well. But if we 
take away the dis two controversial or two disputed uses of Israel in Romans eleven twenty six and Galatians six sixteen. Is it fair? I mean, my re my understanding is that all the other references to Israel in Paul's letters, and I, you know, it seems the same thing to me with Eudias as well. Um, would would all unanimously lead in the direction of not speaking of those as Gentiles in Christ together with Jewish believers in Christ? Um, does that, unless I'm wrong or I'm missing something, I'm just curious what role that observation plays in your exegetical leanings towards um, Galatians 6 16 and Romans 11 26 being different yeah look I don't I don't think it it um um I, I wouldn't think and I don't think it's a knockdown argument um um I, I'd observe that that Israel language is actually pretty rare in Paul's letters um uh he, um, and most of it's in Romans 9 to 11, Israel and Israelite language. Um, when he does use it, it's often qualified. Um, so all Israel or the Israel of God, or um, when you do, you get in, um, in 1 Corinthians 8 to 10, there's the example in chapter 9, isn't there, I think, and he uses, it, it's Israel katasaka um, when they make the sacrifices. Um, which I know there's different ways of reading that, but it, he seems to be leaving room in his mind for a distinction between um, uh, natural, ethnic, bodily um, uh, Israel and some other possible way of thinking about Israel, just as in, in an analogous way, I think in Romans 1, he distinguishes between um, Christ's um, Davidic ancestry according to the flesh and his identity as son that was declared with power by the spirit through his resurrection um, so yeah I, I think it, the, of the few places where Israel language does get used um, Paul um, gives himself room to distinguish between um, one kind of way of being Israel and another future um, possibility of what Israel might embrace so yeah I, I, um, I grant that observation um, but I don't think um, Israel is straightforwardly um, monosemic within Paul's use of that, that word. Hmm. I think Thanks. there's uh, one final comment that uh, the other Joshua, uh, Joshua Garraway, wants to make. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, I, uh, let me turn off my air conditioner. Sorry. It's 100. Um, I, I, I chatted privately to Michael just to ask if I could say one thing on, on this question because, uh, yes, it's 1126, but I mean, Romans 9, the very beginning says that all Israel is not Israel, or however yeah. you translate it, but it, it makes it fairly clear that what Israel means is, is precisely what's under dispute here, mm -hmm. and that you could think Israel is one thing, and he's saying that Israel is another thing. Um, just adding that. Yeah, thank you. Agree. Uh, well, this is really that is probably a, a good note to end our our day, our day evening or night on. Um, tomorrow uh, we'll have uh, Professor Paula Fredrickson uh, joining us uh, with a paper also by Professor Carl Wilhelm. Uh, after that, I then believe we've got uh, Brian Rosner and Ron Charles will be joining us as well for a paper on uh, Paul and uh, the diaspora. And so that's something to look forward to tomorrow. So uh, yeah, I think we're, we're now, I think we're now technically over halfway since um, the fourth session is a, a, a shorter one. So yeah, we're, get, we're getting through it. We've done well. Thank you for everyone who presented uh, today. That's been uh, terrific. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you.